All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our March 2nd, 2021 City Council meeting. It is 7.01 p.m. Meeting is now in session. Tonight's invocation will be led by Pastor Samuel Martinez from Amazing Love Ministries Church, and Councilman Wu will be leading the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. Thank you, Mayor. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy in our great land. And Heavenly Father, we also remember the words of Solomon of old, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And Father, it is the same King Solomon who said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge you. He'll direct your path. Father, we humbly come before you, acknowledging that we do need your help. Give us wisdom. Give us insight and direction. For everyone in authority in, in our great city, Give them wisdom. Father, that everything that be conducted today, Father, be according to your plans and purposes for our great city. We thank you for this grant wisdom, Father, not only to those that are here today, but to our educational leaders, our business leaders. Father, we speak harmony and peace over our neighborhoods, Father. And if there is anyone in our city right now hurting because of a death, a COVID-related death, we pray your comfort on them, Father, because you are the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And now, Father, we acknowledge you. We thank you for our great servicemen and women, past and present, Father, that have sacrificed that we may be enjoying these freedoms. Help us never to take them for granted. And now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for our police officers, and we pray your protection over them. Father, God bless America. God bless West Covina, in Jesus' name. Amen. Assistant City Clerk, roll call, please. Good evening, Mayor. Councilmember Tabatabai? Present. Councilman Wu? Here. Councilwoman Diaz? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Castellanos? Here. Mayor Lopez Viado? Present. City Attorney, is there anything to be reported out of closed session? Nothing, Madam Mayor. Thank you. So uh, for presentations, uh, Senator Susan Rubio is not able to be here today to make a presentation. I do have a presentation, um, which we also have uh, Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio here, uh, well, our representative. So I'll have him join up and he can introduce himself while we go towards our next presentation. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Check. Hello, everyone. My name is Cameron Griffin. Um, this is an introduction to some, a reintroduction to others. I used to cover this area a few months ago for the State Senate, but now I'll be covering it for Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio. Um, so if you ever need anything um, concerning West Covina and the state, please reach out to our office, um, ask for Cameron. I'll be happy to help any of you. And then the presentation. Yeah, please. Do do it first oh, no. Um, well, we could both stay here. But before we do the presentation, I'd like to invite Mr. Levy's son, public information officer from the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District, um, to the front and uh, introduce our upcoming presentation of achievement. Go ahead. Check. Here we go. Check. Check. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council and those in attendance, both here and online. Uh, my name is Levy Sun. I'm the Public Information Officer at the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. Uh, also present with me today is our Education Specialist, uh, Christian Luna. Uh, she's part of our agency's education program called EcoHealth. Tonight, we are proud to join the City of West Covina's recognition of the 2020 Public Health Teachers of the Year. Now, to qualify, educators must complete one of our agent citizen science projects and or go above and beyond to implement our standards-based science curriculum into their classrooms or schools. Uh, I would, I'd like to invite all educators and anyone who knows an educator to visit VectorEducation.org to enroll in any of our citizen science projects 
happening this fall. I would love to see more teachers from West Covina in the running for Public Health Teachers of the Year for this year. Now for 2020, uh, our Public Health Teachers of the Year from West Covina completed Operation Mosquito Grid. Mosquito Grid is one of our citizen science projects and it can be completed with remote learning and teaches students how to protect themselves and their community from mosquito-borne diseases. Now, without further ado, I am proud to announce Danny Wu and Giselle Arguello of San Jose Charter Academy as our West Covina Public Health Teachers of the Year. Can you please? I'd like for you to come up as we'd like to present a certificate from the city of West Covina. So I have... We have certificates from our agency as well. So this is Giselle. Congratulations. Is there anything you'd like to say? Um, you know, I'm, I'm just really happy that we had the opportunity to do this. And um, I invite all teachers in the San Gabriel Valley to participate in the program because it's a really great program. The students really loved it. I didn't know I was supposed to say something today. <laughs> um, but it's just really an, an honor to be recognized here. Um, we, I, I work at a very awesome school with, with uh, just a committed staff, and um, I can't be happier at, at where, I, where I work at in, in that sense where I, I know I have people who um, back, us, back each other up. And my partner here, Ms. Arguello, like, like there's, uh, I couldn't ask for a better person to work with. Um, in that sense, thank you so much. Appreciate it. San Jose Charter is an excellent school. My son actually graduated from there. So it's a, you do an amazing job. The teachers are wonderful. So I just wanted to say thank you. This is a certificate for you. And, uh, you can go, and then let me also, we have a certificate for the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District for Echo Health Vector Education Program. So you come up. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> And we'll go ahead and take a photo, and then I have other certificates. <laughs> and then we'll go ahead. Oh, I know, I'm smiling. <laughs> Please stay here. Uh, we also have from the Calfer State Senate, so she couldn't be here today, from Senator Susan Rubio. So they'd like to present that as well. Here's one. You guys do an amazing job. And then here's for Danny. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we do have another certificate. Your love today. <laughs> get all of them today. They all go ahead. Um, and be, on behalf of Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio and the 48th Assembly District of the State of California, I wanted to give you guys these certificates. Danny Wu first, I'm sorry. And Giselle, on behalf of becoming Public Health Teacher of the Year. So congratulations. <laughs> Okay, thank you again. Have a good night. Um, 
So we'll now move to oral communication. If anyone would like to address the council, please fill out a yellow speaker card and submit to the assistant city clerk. Uh, city clerk, how uh, many speakers do we have tonight? Good evening, Mayor. We have five speakers in-house and we have five speakers on the phone. Okay, go ahead. Our first speaker is Mr. Jim Grivich, followed by Herman, followed by Mike Greenspan. I'm here tonight to ask you to uh, pull item number five off the consent calendar for discussion. Uh, that item is about the, what's called the Comp Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, otherwise known as the CAFR. In this document on page 103, there is a note 22 that is titled COVID-19 and the city's ability to continue as a going concern. For those of you are, that are not aware of audit jargon, the ability to continue as a going concern is the most serious statement that can appear in any audit. In simple terms, there is doubt about the city's continued existence. Considering the importance, I believe it is remiss for this to be a consent item. Furthermore, in the document, uh, there are also three material weaknesses and two significant deficiencies found in a separate a report called uh, internal control. I've seen a lot of audits in my uh, employment history, and this ranks up there as one of the worst. And I, I, I think it needs the serious attention of this city council. At a minimum, I believe the city council and the public are entitled to know what management is gonna do about these findings. Thank you. Herman, followed by Mike Greenspan, followed by Peter Dan. What is oral and effective communication? There's one. Exhibit one. Reopening schools, protecting the borders, saving America from socialism and anti-America. Who's last and who's first in this country? Who shall be last and first in this country? Well, in particular, I would like to ask the junket party when, where, what, why, and when. When Tony Wu and Mr. Johnson, a former councilman, Malcolm, went on a Chinese business trip with a Vietnam vet. Where did they go on their junket trip? Was it for China's interest in our politics? Was it interest in West Covina politics? Well, the taxpayers should know where, when, and why, Tony. In my hand is my indictment. Allegations that West Covina's councilmen have become racketeers, abusers, waste, in your taxpayers' dollars. Here's my indictment. Money laundering false statements under 18 U.S.C. 1014. Mr. Wu, Mayor Letty, for the record, one. West Covina City Manager, number two, for the record. Don't forget, it has the FBI's number if you want to call and talk to them, sir. In addition to that, Councilman Wan, Council District 2, Council District 3, and if I can count right from last recognition, there are four thugs in my book of knowledge. Now, for those interested in heart, what is the First Amendment? 
What is the First Amendment? Is this the First Amendment? Is this the First Amendment? Yeah. I'll address it for you in this manner. What does it all mean? What does First Amendment mean? What did Donald J. Trump to exercise his First Amendment? Well, I'll do it on his behalf in my opening statement for the children. I too like to learn. I like to free myself from the egotistic mannerism of political warfare and slap, threats, malicious lies of local government, bullshitting our taxpayers of West Covina, small businesses, and shutting them down. You, Hilda El Solis, you racketeering old woman, need to fire Barbara Fart, because we're far tired of her, right? And for you small business owners who are afraid to speak up, you are protected by this podium, this arena that I continue to steer in the idea of the American First Amendment. So as long as I'm an American, Tony Wu, and you, Mr. Johnson, veteran, corrupted, lying bag of, yeah, I can't use any other word no more. Because guess what? It's not protected speech according to the mayor. So I wrote it down. I came here looking for something I could not find. Anywhere else. Hey, I'm not trying to be nobody. I just want a chance to be myself. Oh, on the streets of West Covina, you didn't know me, but you still don't like me. You say you care less how I feel, but how many of you sit and judge me? When have you ever walked the streets of West Covina and acknowledge a veteran and a homeless human being? I'll dare you. 42 U.S.C. 1983. Fuck you. Next. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mike Greenspan, followed by Peter Din, followed by Bertie Azapedia. Be sure that gets into the records because I think we're going to be in uh, some uh, issues of investigation here. After all, if UCLA ever wants to lose to Mississippi State away, they'll hear lots of those bells. That's the smallest of three. I don't think they can take it. Mike Greenspan, a brewing butt kicking Florida Gator, an advocate of recalling Governor Gavin, of course. After all, haven't we enjoyed our businesses being closed and people losing their jobs? Well, Governor Gavin has his. Aunt Nancy, what am I going to do with all our millions? They're going to recall me. I'll have to go back to my winery and wine. Wah, wah, wah. And once we get this recall going, there's an issue that we need to talk about. The governor has a blue pencil, and that blue pencil can take veto anything out of the budget. And in that budget of waste, billions of dollars of waste, we have UCLA football, have in the three years they've had a winning season with a $3 million, $3 million we pay Chip Kelly to lose games. What do we get out of it? $3 million poor per year plus all the supportive staff. It, that is money that could be going to homeless support services. Isn't it nice I'm in a city that has no homeless people? It must be wonderful that you have no homeless people. Because if you cared about the homeless, you would get rid of the wastefulness and have our 
money transferred locally for homeless support services. Every time you see UCLA losing a football game, think of the late Stan Laurel of Laurel and Hardy, who would always say, another fine mess you got us into, Ollie. Well, it's another UCLA football loss at the expense of the taxpayers and homeless support services. But I'm in a city that has no homeless people, so it must be nice, this city. Business friendly and so business friendly, they don't have any homeless people. It's, you know when you're in L.A., you know where the city limits start. Look at the tents. I mean, they called Woodstock Tent City. Maybe they should call L.A. Tent City. With all those Democrats they have, they're doing a wonderful job, aren't they? Yes, yes, yes. And, hey, look, the big cities, they're not like those small Bell Gardens and May Woods and everything else. They do have their corruption, but, and there are people going to jail. Mitchell Englander, who ran for supervisor, will be running around the track at Lompoc starting June 1st for the next 14 months. Um, Mr. Weizar will probably remain in prison for life once he loses. He's the biggest denier, this side of Rod Bogoyevich, and it's too bad he's going to be in prison. But now what we need to do is to spend our money better. And when we recall the governor, recall Governor Gavin, I hope I got it for the cameras now. I hope everybody else sees it out here. When we recall that governor and get a new governor, and new governor day was nice. I remember the last time when Arnold became governor, replacing Gray Davis. And, of course, his hair got grayer and grayer as he lost his job. Aw, oh, too bad, isn't it? Too bad I don't have any violin lessons under my belt. I could have played My Heart Cries for you. But when you grow up with air guitars, it's hard to be an air violinist. Well, I'm just looking forward to it happening. I'm looking forward to the money being better spent. After all, you, you guys don't like to waste money, do you? Well, maybe you do. Well, download a petition at www.rescueca2021.com. And in case you haven't signed one of the petitions. Also, I want to thank our pastor for the, gives a prayer for always remembering Jesus. Jesus actually has something in common with Reverend Jimmy Swaggart's last visit to the bordello. What's that, Greenspan? Well, they both come just once. Thank you. Peter Din, followed by Bertie Azapeda, followed by J.D. What's up, Council? Um, I'm here to uh, talk about something that I think we can do that's really positive for our businesses. And I'm here using my First Amendment freedom of speech right to, to make this public comment. So the one thing that I've seen like done um, is the most recently done in Alhambra and other cities um, is that Alhambra had an emergency ordinance to basically cap the percentages that delivery fee serv uh, delivery third party delivery um, services can do to small businesses. So it's usually around 30 percent. Um, but basically, they capped it with an emergency ordinance and a unanimous vote to 15%. Um, and that's really helped small businesses around the area. Um, and just by doing that, it kind of incentivizes the community to either not rely on the delivery services, and it takes the strangle off the businesses as well, just by bringing it down that 15%. Um, cities like Pasadena have done it. I know we love that Pasadena comparison. I mean, they did it. So um, Los Angeles City and County has also done it, and it's really proven to help these businesses. Um, I know, like all of you know, that our small businesses provide a service to us much greater than, you know, any plate of food. Um, I, I go on Facebook. I, you know, I don't want to go on Facebook, but I have to go on Facebook to realize what's going on here. Um, but, you know, I see on Bescovino Buzz um, and his pizza owner and, and every, all the owners of the restaurants and businesses, they really just stand up for the community. And I think this is a simple step that we could take to reducing from 30% to 15%. I use Uber Eats a lot. They charge me, like, so many fees. Like, I pay for the meal, and it's, like, $10 additional fee. And then they ask me at the end, do I want to give money to the business? And I'm like, what, what's that $10 then? You know what I mean? And then I feel bad when I click no, you know. But that's beside the point. But I think that this can be really good. Um, the statistics show that 60% of small businesses across the country that have closed because of COVID are now permanently closed. I think that's a travesty. I think to a lot of people, our government has failed us. I really hope that businesses can look up to the city council, our leaders, and basically um, and see that, that you know, um, they're protected by the city council 
and they're going to be protected from these delivery services that are very greedy and, and are just trying to take the profit from them. So I think that we can do this. I think that if we can overcome any political barrier to do it, it's a good first step to serve the people that, that you know, spend their lives serving us in our community. So pretty positive thing. Don't worry. No controversy at this public comment. So please agendize this at the next meeting. Pass this unanimously. I think it will really help, and small businesses are behind it. Um, for Change West Covina Small Business Saturdays, like all the small businesses are, are just really want help, um, and they love to see the community come out. So I think this, to bring it down from 30 to 15 percent, I think it's a unanimous decision. I think it can happen, um, and I hope we bring it up at the next meeting and it happens. So thank you. Thank you. Please don't forget about this. Thank you. <laughs> Bertie, followed by JD, followed by Ralph Galvin. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, and staff. It's been a long time since I've been here, and boy, I got excitement already. I've got nothing. <laughs> anyway, I'm here because I was surprised to hear about uh, we are going back to the Ballon Park Animal Shelter. And um, I have some concerns. Some of us who paid for the license to Ballon Park, and then you did the switchover to Pomona, we had to pay again. Some of us got our checks back. So I'm hoping that you get what you're owed by Pomona, and I know that Baldwin Park still owes us money. Because when I was here the last time to fight against Pomona Valley, because I had issues with them years ago with a district attorney, and I won, and that council got them out on the first contract, which basically what you're doing right now. On a con they have a short contract. Um, I'm kind of surprised because um, I called the manager at the Ballon Park Animal Shelter today. I called the licensing department in Downey today. They were kind of surprised that I guess I knew we were going to go with them July 1st. And I told them they cannot take money from the citizens of West Covina after we paid them and then within the year had to pay Pomona. So, you know, I'm hoping that you do something about this. I would like to see a council meeting take place with the manager of Ballon Park and with Marsha Maeda, the director. You can't get her. You can't talk to her. Uh, she's one of the worst directors. Because when Frank Andrews came here, he's been trying for years to get into uh, West Covina, and it didn't happen until we got rid of uh, Pomona. I begged him to be here. And that city council voted 5-0 to take Ballon Park in. I'm going to give you a little history about West Covina. When I first moved out here 48 years ago, you know who we had to deal with? San Gabriel Humane Society. We bought our home in the Woodside Village area, brand new tracks. So, you know, dogs get lost and we had to go away to San Gabriel. I take care of my animals like my kids. I had to go over there. I found two of my dogs there. I come home and I tell my neighbors, oh, guess what? Your dog's in San Gabriel. Your dog's in San Gabriel. Oh, I'm not going to drive all the way over there. So that's when I started to fight to get Baldwin Park in. I don't know why you guys pulled out of Pomona after I begged you guys not to, and they all stood there, except for her, and oh, Lloyd was here, voted 5-0. I'm a longtime resident. I know what West Covina needs. I've been here for years. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Whoa. Um, um, so I'm hoping, and I did talk to the city manager, I want him to find out because Nicole sat there. When I spoke to all of you, asking you not to go up Pomona, I, I told her, I went like this, I go, they stole all this money, Bone Park. And she goes, well, I can't answer that, Bertie. And what did she do? She left us in the dust. Had I known that night that her father was sitting back there telling me, oh, but you got to have us come back. You got to, no, 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 I got them out. I'm the one that got Pomona out back then. Had I known that was her father, I would have told all you guys, hey, you know what? Her father's the big shot. So she, in a way, turned around and stabbed us when she left. And, uh, but I'm sorry. Uh, you know, this is crazy. I'm hoping that somebody gets to the bottom of it, but I like to see a meeting. I don't care if it's a town hall meeting. We have questions to ask Baum Park. Your people never do that. We need town hall meetings again. Yeah, use the, you know, the Cameron Center because there's questions a lot of people ask. Now, I'm getting phone calls. You want to know about what? They want to know how to go back to regular council members and no districts. 
And I go, well, okay, I'm not going to get involved with that. Oh, hi, Brian. <laughs> Brian called me today. We had over an hour talk. A gentleman in my district called me. The past gentleman in my district who I'd known for years would never call me. So, you know, I wish you luck, and I wish you luck. So I'm hoping to take care of this. This is my main project. And my second project is we got to get more law enforcement in the city of West Covina. And that should be all your number one priorities. And put the second animal control. How's that sound? Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your time. And um, I'm going to be following up on this. And I'm going to give him a call in two weeks like I told him. So please, send me, get Marsha Maeda out here, the director. Get her out here. She don't take calls because she's not a people person. When, when, if I have to call you and you're avoiding my call, you never call me, you're not a people person. You shouldn't be in the position. You follow me? So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Our next speaker is JD, followed by Ralph Garvin, followed by Mr. Shoemaker. evening. No foul words, I promise. Um, I've got a question about code enforcement. Um, kind of like to know what the role is, because I know at one time it was under the umbrella of the police department. It was a one person, I believe it was a lady officer who handled that, uh, that responsibility. I've noticed that it has expanded exponentially. It's now I would imagine, just guessing, it consists of maybe three or four code enforcers, because that's how many cars I've seen out in the streets. I believe I saw a director come to this podium and give a presentation. I would probably imagine that he draws a salary somewhere in the six digits, right? Uh, I'm sure he's not poorly paid. So when did this department come about? Uh, was it budgeted? Was it approved during one of those non-consent approvals that nobody knows about? Because honestly, they have new Tacoma Toyota trucks. There's like three or four of them, and there's a director. I would imagine they probably have some sort of clerical support. I'm not sure if they're still under the police auspices, but they certainly uh, seem like a new city department. In light of your emergency meeting in regards to divorcing from county and taking on the sole responsibility at some point in the future of the health department, that's going to be a tremendous cost to the city. And as a resident, and I think there are many out there that would agree with me. We see a lot of expenditures from this, this city council, approving a lot of expenditures. And before you even came to, to council, uh, and before our current city manager, his predecessor announced to everyone that we were in finance, financial straits. We were having financial problems. And you admitted that, to that as well. But it seems to me that you're willing to expend like there's no tomorrow. New department, taking on a health department. Uh, you know, if what comes in the front door goes out at twice the rate, we're going to be broke. We're going to be broke. But honestly, I, I'd like to know what exactly is the role of code enforcement. Are they supposed to be out helping the police during car accidents? Because that's what I've observed. Um, they seem to control traffic. So are they with the police department? Are they an independent department? Um, I thought they were going to maybe focus in on some of the illegal dwellings that are coming up in the city and other areas that may need, the police may need help with that, you know, they can serve a purpose, but it's, it's just seems so ambiguous to me that I'm, I'm, just asking for clarification. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next 
Mr. Galvin, if you can please unmute yourself. Try star six. You're our next speaker. Hi, good evening, Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, staff, and members of the West Community community. My name is Ralph Galvan. I'm a Baldwin Park resident and the newest board member on the Valley County Water District. The Valley County Water District services a few homes in the West Community Council District Area 1, bordering Baldwin Park from Willow Avenue to Puente Avenue, and from the 10th Freeway to West Pacific Avenue. I just wanted to hop on and first say Happy New Year and congratulations to Rosario and Brian for the successful election in 2020. I want to share a few highlights. The entire board recently approved a rate delay, meaning water rates won't be going up for those residents serviced by the Valley County Water District. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I'm also excited to announce that we are... Excuse, I'm sorry, uh, you sound muffled. If you can kind of... Uh, let me take off my headphones. Okay, thank you. Hello, can you hear me better? Much better, thank you. Okay, sorry, should I start over or could you... Did you hear all that? You can continue. Okay, so I'm also excited to announce that we are celebrating our 95th anniversary this year. Some events are being planned, and currently we have a save the date for a water awareness drive through set for Friday, May 21st, 2021. Last, there's a college scholarship opportunity from the Water Education Water Awareness Committee available for students in the Valley County Water District Service Area. The Water Scholar Program provides financial support to high school seniors planning to attend a two- or four-year college in the following school year. The link is available on our website, vcwd.org, under the News Flash section. In addition, our newly updated website has a variety of free printable activities to do with your kids, and if you're a teacher looking for engaging educational activity for your classroom, like coloring pages to word searches. We also have water saving tips for, um, for, saving tips for, for kids, for the home and for your business. You may visit http colon forward slash forward slash vcwg.org forward slash 204 forward slash education. Last, I look forward to meeting you all in person when that time comes. I know we already have a great partnership between the city of West Covina and the Valley County Water District, but if I could be of service, please feel free to reach out. I'll be emailing you my contact information. Thank you for your time and have a great night. Thank you, have a good night. Mr. Shoemaker, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, just a couple items tonight. First of all, when it comes to the financial uh, review for the second quarter and things like that, uh, as I read everything, I'm trying to figure out, is the city manager and finance director saying that although we've received about what 30 or 40 percent of our money that we're going to receive the other 60 to 70 percent in the next couple months. I'm a little confused on that. Also, when I look at individual line items that says we were expecting somewhere around 15 million in sales tax and we've received 5 million, is, is there been a bunch of uh, sales that would in our city that would, or in our state that would generate an additional 10 million dollars in taxes that we would receive? So I'm a little confused about these, uh, uh, what would appear to be funny numbers, to say the least. Um, so, you know, needless to say, that's uh, one of the things. Also, I'm wondering why they just don't put something together that says, on a year-to-date basis, that says, this is how much total revenues we've received for the entire city, and this is the expenses for the entire city, not just, pick, you know, general funds and things like that, because there are other things that come about. And also, full uh, 2021 expected. Uh, one, other last one other item is uh, the pension bonds. Uh, I'd like to see the amounts when we received that $204 million and how much went to CalPERS and when it went to CalPERS. So there isn't any revenues being shown that shouldn't be there. Another item that I was a little concerned about was last uh, meeting. Uh, I don't recall a situation where a sitting commissioner, especially a planning commissioner, referred to a sitting member of the council, flat out called them a liar. Maybe they said they were misleading or not being 100% truthful, but to flat call them a liar is unprecedented. 
you know, last time I looked, commissioners, even though they might be appointed by one person, work for the consul and work for the city, not, uh, not political people. You know, and the person who is calling our uh, council member a liar, I have no problem uh, meeting him anywhere he would like to discuss if, uh, which Brian is the bigger liar. I have no doubt it would be Gutierrez because all you have to look at is campaigns over the years and you see those, uh, those things that occur. Also, I'd just like to direct the public, and I'll be finished for the night. Uh, there's been something I published out on, on Facebook, on West Covina Insider, West Covina Forum, and West Covina Residence that explains why we need to make some serious changes at the senior level of our staff. And I thank you, and that takes care of me for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Minerva Avila, followed by James Toma. Ms. Avila, go ahead. Uh, good evening. Minerva Avila, West Covina resident. I live in District 4. Um, after asking last week for an update on the development of BKK, I, I did hear from city staff. I was told via email that, quote, the city development opportunity parcels have not been sold, unquote, and that, uh, quote, the city is not currently negotiating with St. Poli, unquote. I would like for you to clarify here publicly what options the city is currently considering with regard to the uh, BKK landfill, uh, the city parcels. Is St. Poli no longer an interested party, and um, is the city negotiating with other interested parties? I believe uh, the, um, the city was expecting $13.5 million, right, for that land. If you could provide an update, I would appreciate it. I do want to note that um, any intense development at the BKK landfill area is, potential public health, is a potential public health disaster. Yet for years, the majority on the council has pushed along the proposed Simpoli development with little interest in listening to, public, uh, to the residents' public health concerns. In the press release issued last week after the vote to leave L.A. County Public Health, the mayor is quoted as stating, quote, West Covina will remain focused on protecting the environment and ensuring the health and safety of its residents, workers, visitors, and neighboring community, unquote. The irony is not lost on residents. If the attention this city has given to public health concerns at BKK is an indication of how the city's proposed health department will handle environmental and health matters, then we, the residents of West Covina, are doomed. Three of you on this city council have a history of ignoring and trying to silence concerns regarding BKK. I have plenty of examples. I'll just share a few. For raising questions regarding the health concerns associated with the development at BKK, I have been almost forcefully removed from the podium, called a disparaging name, um, on social media by Councilman Wu's uh, city commissioner, made to ask questions multiple times, and I've been censored along with 279 other residents for asking the city to vote against the extension of the purchase and sale agreement with St. Poli. If I ask a question about BKK, I am forced to ask it multiple times before it is answered. I have to CC all my other elected representatives for example, this past year, I asked at five different times about the inadequacies of the gas monitoring system at the BKK landfill. Five times. When, it, when the question was finally answered, Councilman Wu stated that the landfill gas is drawing to a close. Nope, that is not the case. I believe um, all of you have the letter that announces the conditional approval for the first phase of replacement of the landfill gas monitoring probes, precisely because the gas is still there and will be with no end, no end in sight. At one point, the city stated that information pertaining to the proposed and pulley development at BKK would be posted and updated on the city's website. That also has not been the case. The current information on the city's website still states, and I quote, at this time, the city is working with Simpoli Group LLC toward the sale of the city parcels on and on. The city's website does not provide regular updates. A better source of information regarding BKK and, de and the Singpoli development is the city manager's 
own personal website. Yes, his has more articles about BKK and other city matters than the city's own website. And his website is updated regularly. It's quite handy. The most recent article was posted on January 28, 2021. By the way, Mr. Carmine, those articles are not properly cited. The majority on this city council would rather not discuss the public health concerns associated with proposed development projects. Rather, they want to discuss fancy hotels and Coachella-like concerts. And that's the problem. That's the problem. This council puts development ahead of public health. If you seriously cared about public health, you would be handling the BKK development much differently. Please answer, what option... What options the city is currently considering with regard to the BKK landfill, the city parcels? Is Singpoli no longer an interested party? Is the city negotiating with other interested parties? Let's see if we can get these questions answered here today on the first try. I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Toma. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is James Toma. I'm a resident of West Covina, a former council member and mayor. As you know, I commented on the city's ill-advised action last week to move to terminate its relationship with the L.A. County Public Health Department. The city has no plan to protect public health and had no cost estimates for that decision. Since then, the mayor's commissioner, Mr. Brian Gutierrez, has posted numerous times on West Covina next door false statements that I was involved in, quote, criminal activity involving a failed break-in attempt and that I sent minors to try to break into his house. These statements are all false. The mayor appointed Mr. Gutierrez as her commissioner in January after he was defeated by Councilmember Tabatabai in the November 2020 election. I emailed the mayor that her commissioner was spreading lies about me on social media and her response was to deny any responsibility. Ironically, the mayor terminated her previous commissioner for purported public statements that she had made. I've never had a conversation with Mr. Gutierrez. He has never asked me if I was ever involved in any attempted break-in. The answer is, of course, no. This is a false attack on a resident that the mayor should not allow from any city employee, let alone her own commissioner who serves at her will. The city's rules of conduct for commissioners states that no commissioner should engage in conduct in violation of law. Defamation is a violation of law. The mayor's commissioner's statements are false. They were published. I have provided the city with those statements, and he knew or should have known that they were false. The city rules also prohibit a commissioner from engaging in conduct that interferes with the ability of any city employee to perform their duties or creates an intimidating or hostile work environment. When a commissioner attacks a city council member with the same false statements accusing him of a crime, doesn't it create an intimidating and hostile work environment? The city's policy regarding ethical standards requires that employee conduct to be, quote, beyond reproach both on and off the job. The city's policy also prohibits employees from promulgating information concerning city officials that is false or disruptive to the work environment without official authorization. So did the mayor's commissioner publish these defamatory statements about a council member with authorization? The mayor's commissioner is now taken to another Facebook page to make these same defamatory statements. The city manager has written to me that he's referring this matter to another city employee. I would like to know what the mayor intends to do. The commissioner serves at the mayor's sole discretion and at her pleasure. Has the mayor asked her own commissioner what basis he has for making these serious accusations about a resident and her own colleague? Because if he can give no basis for these accusations, and I assure you he doesn't, the question becomes, what are her values in determining who should represent the city? I look forward to your response. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mayor Pro Tem from the city of La Puente, Valerie Munoz. Good evening. Um, can everyone hear me okay? We, we can hear you, Mayor Pro Tem. 
thank you. Hello, good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. Um, Valerie Munoz, Mayor Pro Tem for the City of La Puente. But more importantly, I am your representative on the San Gabriel Basin Water Quality Authority, uh, appointed back in 2019. Um, I represent cities with non-pumping rights, West Covina being one of them as well. And one of my pledges that I made during my my, look, my election for this seat was to ensure that I always keep our cities informed on water cleanup efforts. I want to first um, congratulate the new council members on the dais this evening and also wanted to just give you a general update regarding the Water Quality Authority. Um, as their director, um, my goal is to provide just a brief update periodically. The WK was created back in, by the California State Legislature back in 1993. Primary goal was to tackle issues of contaminated aquifers. The San Gabriel um, Water Basin provides 90%, 92% of the water in the San Gabriel Valley. And over the years, um, with the combined six um, operable units in the San Gabriel Valley, the cleanup projections are estimated at $1.3 billion to review remove harmful contaminants from our local groundwater. As of today, over 81 tons of contaminant has been removed, and our, um, that is due to efforts of the Water Quality Authority. And we have secured over $500 million in sediment, settlements from responsible um, in, um, entities to help with the cleanup efforts. Funding sources consist of state at 3.7%, local resources at 9%, and then federal 12% with responsible parties uh, over 74%. Um, I wanted to just um, invite you. I know all of um, the, our agency has sent over to your city manager and city clerk that we will be hosting a um, Water Quality Authority special update for city officials. This would be a great opportunity for new council members who would like to be introduced to the San Gabriel Water Quality Authority and hear of the great work we do here for all of your constituents. Um, we will be hosting this update on Thursday, March 4th at 12 p.m. It'll take approximately 30 minutes. Hopefully, it, you guys can enjoy it's an online webinar. And topics will include benefits of earmarks for the San Gabriel Basin cleanup, um, the San Gabriel Valley ground, groundwater contamination updates, and also Prop 68 funding. If you have any questions or would like to register for a 30-minute Quick update for um, local officials, um, please contact me. I have included my cell phone number on the initial email to, to the assistant city clerk. Um, and I will also have the, our staff members re-email the Zoom information and registration um, again later tomorrow morning um, for anyone who is interested. I look forward to continue to represent the great city of West Covina, and I'm here at your service for any questions that you may have at a later time. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, we have one more speaker, Colleen Rosati. Good evening, everyone. Colleen Rosati, City Treasurer, member of the Audit and Finance Committee, President of West Covina Beautiful, <clears throat> excuse me, an educator, special education, West Covina High School. Over the last couple months, um, members of the community have reached out to me regarding various decisions that have recently been made by the City Council and staff. And tonight, I thought I'd take the opportunity to share some of their questions and concerns with you. And hopefully, once that's done, we can get some answers to them regarding their concerns for the community. First of all, city finances. A question that was asked to, uh, to me was, will the city be holding town hall meetings coming up as we approach the city budget and its planning? And if so, can you please plan them later than four o'clock in the afternoon, either by Zoom or in person, to allow residents the opportunity to come and participate. So that's number one. Secondly, Audit and Finance Committee. In June of 2020, it was noted that term limits of two residents who sit currently on the committee were ending. I asked about the positions and if they were going to be made available for residents to apply. The HR department 
said that they would be posting them on the city website, which they did do approximately June 11th. There were over 40 applications. 16 were West Covina residents. 24 were not. At the January 2021 meeting, the second one, I believe, the city council chose the members to sit on that audit and finance committee. Unfortunately or fortunately, no changes were made. So the question that was approached to me by the folks that applied said, why did it take six months to make a decision? They found that unprofessional. They found it disrespectful to their time only to end up with the same folks that were currently on there. And that's not to say that they're not doing a great job. That is your choice. But as an applicant who took the time to fill out the application and to wait six months with no communication as to what the status was, they found that very inappropriate. So I hope going forward we can do better. Lastly is community service and community activities. As president of West Covina Beautiful, as all of you know, this is the oldest nonprofit organization here in the city. And we have done an excellent job being relevant during the pandemic. In June of 2020, we did a very large impact project for a resident who needed our help. And we successfully did that for him. During the summer months, we did cleanup projects th throughout the city at various parks. In October, we participated in the Halloween trick-or-treat at the mall. In November, we partnered with Hilda Solis, Supervisor Solis's office, and adopted 10 families and gave them Thanksgiving dinners. In December, we continued to do our Home for the Holiday Tour, which was very successful, and it brought in over 8,000 folks engaging in this program. So my concern is this. As we move forward and restrictions are starting to be lifted, lifted Let's look at our community service organizations. And one of the things that came up was on the 12th of December, we had three activities planned. And so folks had to make a choice. With the limited amount of services that the city is providing, community service groups are trying to fulfill our obligation and help you out by providing activities that folks can participate in. So I suggest that we be more mindful either with a general calendar that we can put all our dates on so that there's no overlapping, so that people don't have to decide what event they want to go to. Services are very limited. Events are very limited. Let's be more proactive with that. And on that note, I can tell you that um, November 13th, 2021, West Covina Beautiful will be holding their annual fashion show and champagne brunch. And we've already scheduled the birthday bash for year 99 in February, probably the third weekend. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to come last meeting, but I wanted to address the community and wish West Covina a happy birthday, number 98, February 17th. And as we approach the centennial, we'll start working on that coming up, and we're excited to do so. If you're interested in participating in an impact project, reach out to West Covina Beautiful at gmail.com. Thank you, and I hope I can get some answers on those questions that was asked of me. Thanks, Steve. Was that in our... That's all our speakers, Mayor. Okay. Um, well, before I uh, pass it to City Manager to respond, I just wanted to let Mr. James Toma, the matter that you mentioned with my commissioner has been turned into the City Attorney and HR to look into. That being said, uh, City Manager, may you please respond to the public comments, concerns. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council, members of the public, to briefly try to respond to some of the questions that were raised this evening. And thank people for taking the time to participate in this way. Um, Mr. Grivich is well-versed on the city's finances and participates actively on the city's finance and audit committee. Um, and they did receive a presentation from the finance director and auditor at their last meeting. He made two cogent points tonight and asked kind of um, in summary what's next in terms of the city finances. I'd like to begin to say that the city's taking quite seriously the audit report by the state auditor's office and has responded in a very timely way 
and um, substantively to the state auditor, first with a corrective action plan, which addressed their f major findings, and then secondly, the follow-up to that, which is due to the state auditor in June, is the financial recovery plan addressing with key milestones the um, things that the city needs to do um, differently and better to be uh, good stewards of its finances. That financial recovery plan will be presented to the Finance and Audit Committee at its March 24th meeting. Um, Mr. Herman, Mr. Greenspan um, mentioned um, a number of things, including that the homeless need better support services. We've asked our chief of police and key members of that department to make a presentation as part of tonight's agenda, so I think we'll address a number of those concerns. Peter, um, thank you for the comments about better support of businesses. I hadn't seen that ordinance, nor I don't believe the council members have, that was adopted in Alhambra and Pasadena, capping the percentages that a third party could charge for delivery services. But if you've got the ordinance and could send it to me, that'd be useful. If not, I can call the city manager over there and get it. I'd like to, like to see that. Um, Bertie made a few points, most of them about animal control services. Um, doesn't want to pay twice. Couldn't agree more as a dog owner. Um, believes that Baldwin Park owes the city money. We are in communication with both the County of Los Angeles Animal Control and Inland Valley about transition issues. Um, we haven't raised that question as to if Baldwin Park and the county owes the city money. We can certainly add that to the list of many things. And once a, another town hall meeting, we did have representatives at the last meeting or the one before from the animal control people. When we're looking at the contract, we could certainly uh, request of them that they come again if that's the pleasure of the council. Um, JD asked about code enforcement. Was it budgeted? It certainly was. It's a division we've stood up within the community development on the second floor of City Hall. They've got um, one full-time manager who runs that unit and an army of part-timers. When I say army, I think there's six or seven. It's just a number of hours that, that the budget allocates to that function. And we staff it uh, we fill in all the time slots seven days a week. They focus on um, violations of the zoning, the planning, building standards of the city, the zoning ordinance. If there's construction without permits, we get a complaint about it. If there's illegal conversions, if there's uh, property maintenance issues. I'd like to say that this has turned into be a real bright spot for the city. I'm happy to speak with JD um, separately and offline if he's interested to understand what those budget numbers look like and what the city incurs for costs for that function. I think it's working pretty well. Um, Ralph made some points about water awareness, and I'm going to have to um, owe him a response to that. And perhaps there's need of more presentations in front of this council or in, in a town hall setting about water awareness. We don't think we can, in California, ever forget that. Mr. Shoemaker asked some questions about the city's finances. Um, the sales tax reports we publish quarterly, and I can share those. Um, he asked a question about the proceeds of the pension obligation bonds. Of the $204 million, we were racing against a deadline so as to issue the pension obligation bonds rather than make a required CalPERS payment by the end of July last. Um, that $186 million that was sent to CalPERS towards the city's unfunded liability there was wired in upon close of the transaction, so it never touched the city. It went directly from the bond buyers to the to the CalPERS. And it was a, a wire transaction, and believe me, we called several times to confirm receipt of it, and they, they do have it. Um, the other proceeds of the bond, the $186 million or so that went to CalPERS, um, there was another $17 million or so that was set aside as part of that transaction in reserve, assuming the city could ever falter and not make one of its annual payments. Um, more typically, and it's our intention here certainly, that would be the last payment that the city owes. We'd basically get the last payment for free. We kept the time term, we kept the tenor the same, so we weren't extending the term of the debt, and we didn't increase the dollar amount. There was some money set aside as part of that transaction for working capital. That's gonna need to return to council for you to make a decision about how that money gets expended. It would have to be budgeted in order to be expended. Um, one possible use of many might be some of our um, needs in the finance arena for a new finance system would be one good example, but we'll, we'll have that on your agenda to look at. Um, Ms. Avila asked about the parcel at the 
uh, development opportunity site? Has it been sold? No. Are we in conversations with others about it? No. Are we requesting proposals now? No, we're not. And certainly the potential public health concerns are, are valid. And if and when we return to soliciting proposals again or some interest uh, were to reappear, that escrow did not close by the deadline. So we're not um, pursuing that. We're not in conversation. We're not meeting about it. But we will certainly um, place that back on the agenda if any parts of that puzzle change. Um, I'm not sure if I owe any further response to Mr. Toma, but those complaints or concerns about violation of city policies, hostile work environment, harassment behaviors would normally and properly be um, investigated as warranted by our HR director, who really has an independent function in that regard. Um, and I, that has uh, occurred, and I did respond uh, via an email to Mr. Thomas, so he would be aware of that. Um, I think it was today that I got back to him about that. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Munoz of the City of La Puente um, has been pretty good about giving us updates on the water quality authority um, activities, and those are always appreciated. Um, City Treasurer Rosati asked, will there be town hall meetings regarding the budget? That's our intention to do that again this year as we did um, last year and I believe the year before. And I think that's all I've got this evening. Thank you. Councilman Wu has a comment. Uh, on, on, I want to answer, okay, on the President, okay, our treasurers, Pauline Rosati, regarding we receive. Can you hear me? Is all? A mic is on, right? You can hear me? Mic is on. <clears throat> you can I hear me? You can hear me, right? Okay, uh, I just want to answer, okay, I did receive all the resume. I did review, okay, about, I forgot, maybe 30 of them. So I review each of them, apply about, okay, our audit and finance commissioner. Okay, most of them looking for a regular pay, like 40,000, 60,000. I don't know you you saw the resume. And some of them looking for internship. So really doesn't have that many of people qualify a CPA or auditor. We, we're looking for a professional can help us because myself, I'm not a okay, CPA, I'm not a auditor. We need somebody in that ground. So what I see with all less 30 myself, okay, and uh, I see still, okay, the I think James, okay, really passionate about that. Okay, maybe I sometimes I disagree with him, but he's still, I think it's an asset to the our city to give some other suggestion, okay, okay, and then Marsha Solorio, personally, I think she's uh, one of very qualified. She's a senior auditor. I think she can help us. I really review everything. I cannot find anybody have a resume, but I don't know which one you think is, is really good. But I did review everything. So myself, I, 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 I nominate, okay, uh, Marsha. Okay, so anyway, this is uh, my, okay, feedback to you. Uh, next on, uh, city manager's report. Um, good evening again. I just had a couple items I wanted to make mention of this evening. Um, first, I'm pleased to report that we began construction today on the Shadow Arc Park, the new playground there. Um, it's to be completed by May of this year. Funding for this is um, Measure A funding in the amount of $339,000. Parts of this playground are accessible. There's some musical features that we think are going to be fun. The main feature is a tower that will make um, the children, when they get to that elevation and have a view of the beyond, feel very high. And so we think that'll be um, it'll be a fun new playground. Next slide. We d took receipt of four new uh, vehicles for our police department. We want to keep them in proper equipment. Next slide. I um, wanted to make mention of our senior services program. We're now offering uh, tax preparation for seniors. It's a partnership with the AARP Foundation, um, and they've got uh, a fairly innovative approach to provide uh, free tax aid to seniors for those that uh, income qualify, and they can make appointments um, by contacting um, the senior center. We list the phone number here, 626-331-5366. Clients can remain in their vehicle during the, their tax appointment. Next slide. On, on the council's agenda tonight is the CAFR. And it was a bit of a moment, and I wanted to highlight it. 
um, one of the places to look is always the general fund of the city. The special revenue funds, the restricted funds um, are always useful to us. They always come with strings. But the general fund is where you typically always look in a um, municipal budget. And this little chart shows where the city has stood with its unassigned general fund balance historically for the last few years. You can see the decline in 1516. It was about $15 million. The city was spending into the reserves in 1617, took it down to 14 million, spent into it again in 1718, took it down to 11.9 million, spent into it again in 1819, took it down to 9.8 year. We've reversed that trend and this year grew the general fund reserves for fiscal year ended 630 uh, last to $12.5 million. So kudos to our finance director for being a very good steward of the city's um, money and getting that unassigned fund balance to 12.6 million. Next slide. We remain in the purple tier with the accompanying um, restrictions from LA County Health. And I think that's all I've got for a manager's report this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Do you have questions? Go ahead. Uh, Councilman's about to buy. Uh, on, the, on the Shadow uh, Park, uh, I, I wanted to to make sure that uh, it was going to be a, an, in, an inclusive uh, park for uh, also having some features for uh, children with disabilities. Through the chair, if I may, um, parts of the, the playground are accessible, not all of the parts, but certainly some of them. It's not considered an entirely accessible park that sometimes comes to mind. Um, that would be a good goal for us as we look at these playgrounds going forward for not all of them, but some of them certainly. No, for the inclusive, we do have uh, Cameron Park, because I remember as a community and senior service commissioner, we made sure to do that, so that they have that for all children with disabilities or anything, and wheelchair. Thank you. And, and then the, the, the other question was um, on the, the, the fund balance. Um, can, can you uh, maybe uh, speak to um, what, what, what led to the, the increase that's, did you want to pull that item so that they could discuss? I mean, I, I was I was going to pull it. it okay. Was, yeah. So we can, they, they'll further discuss. Yeah. So um, now that we're talking about consent calendar, uh, Tabata Bai would like to pull agenda item, is it five? Wait, five or six? Five. Uh, and, uh, okay. and then any other council? Six. Mayor Pro Tem. Anyone else? Can, yeah, can, can I have one question on uh, four? You want to pull number four? Yeah. Okay, we can pull number four. So anybody else would like to pull? No? Okay, so do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar one through six with the exception of four, five, and six? So move. Second. Okay, roll call. Council member Tabatabai? Aye. Councilman Wu? Aye. Councilwoman Diaz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Castellanos? Aye. Mayor Lopez Viado? Aye. Motion approves. Okay, on to item number four, pulled by Councilmember Tabatabai. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, I, I had a, a, a question on, uh, on page three of, of the, the report. Uh, it talks about the uh, unfunded accrued liability uh, in, the, in the general fund. Uh, can, can you... Um, explain to residents so there's been a lot of questions about the pension obligation bond and 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 you know I know you mentioned about the 186 million dollars that got wired of the 204 million dollars and so um, if I could get some clarification on the that that monies and if it's a uh, I'm assuming that's one-time uh, money for Passing the pension obligation bond? Well, through the chair, we invite our finance director to the podium. It's going to be director's night at the consent calendar, so <laughs> we could just keep her here through these various questions. You're gonna, probably going to have a long night. <laughs> Get comfortable. <laughs> Thank you for that. Go ahead. 
So if I understand the question you're asking about the 205 million in pension obligation bonds, yes, that's one time um, money. That was not in the reports. I factored um, that out of the second quarter report because it skews all the numbers. Okay, so on on page three, when uh, it talks about uh, the, the the budget amendment, uh, and so if, if, I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, um, for instance, our capital improvement of the 1.6 million to the fire department, um, that 1.6 million is is that coming from the that uh, unfunded accrued liability? The money is coming not from the unfunded liability. The unfunded liability was paid through the pension obligation bonds. Right. No, I, I so there okay. was savings in the budget because the budget had already gone to print and there was in the general fund eleven almost twelve million that would have had to be spent. So yes, it's one time money. I wouldn't characterize it as unfunded accrued liability money. Okay, so just just so I, I can I can I can grasp it. Had there not been the pension obligation bond, we would have made that uh, 11, 11 point eight million dollar right. payment from the general fund. But because we, so 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 it's kind of like a uh, like a cash out refi on a house. I guess uh, if I'm understanding correct, right? So I I refinance my mortgage. Then there's money I would have paid to my mortgage, but I didn't have to pay it because I did that refi. And then now I used that leftover money uh, on on these other uh, items. Is it, yeah. Okay. Is is that cash out? It's a way and ten. I think we are way and ten. We didn't cash out any money. My, yeah. yeah I I believe it's two hundred four million, and we exactly financed two hundred four million. It's a way and ten we find. When you say cash out, so meaning, Almonte they did a cash out. Yeah. They get another eleven million dollar extra. So it's a cash out to pay. We didn't, right? We cash out. We didn't. Well, I remember we only approved 204, so we can lower the payment from, okay, 7% to 3.7%. Yep. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll clarify. Uh, you're right. So it would be you, you refi, and then you don't have to make that mortgage payment the next month because the refi took care of it. And then you took that money you would have sent right as a normal payment that's the better analogy yes. the only yes. quote unquote cash out so to speak is the right. 1 million working cash right out. right right exactly okay any other question for item 4 uh, would anybody like to motion to approve a uh, motion to approve second roll call council member tabatabai aye councilman wu aye councilwoman diaz aye mayor pro tem castellanos aye Mayor Lopez Viado. Aye. Motion approves 5 0. On to item 5. Councilman Tabatabai, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so I, I did have uh, questions. Uh, first, on uh, page uh, 103, uh, during the city manager's report, uh, you, um, where it says, uh, the amount of two hundred four million for the purposes of funding all or a portion of its CalPERS obligation. Now, you during your city manager report said um, working capital, uh, and here in our CAFR it says capital improvements for the city. So, uh, I guess uh, my my question, just for clarification, uh, that that should say working capital. No, it's capital improvements. That's what it says in the bond document that was issued. Okay, so uh, city manager then, th what you said in the city manager report about that money being working capital and then the, can, can you explain that? There's a little bit of confusion there. I think I'm going to take the correction. I was responding to a public comment that was made and probably used the wrong term, but we'll go with Robin's answer which is the wording used in the bond documents. Okay, so, so then can, can you explain uh, the difference between 
working capital versus uh, capital improvement of the city? How, how does that, that change uh, the way that money uh, can be used? I can explain the definition of working capital is simply assets minus your liabilities, um, and that's your working capital. So basically, fund balance. Um, yeah, so, so, so when, the, when the city manager spoke about working capital, he, he explained it just now that it was, it was restrictive because he said that he was going to need the, the council to to go ahead and, and uh, I don't know if it was, it was change the language or, or allow for some, some spending of that, that money. Well, the council controls the purse strings. So any expenditures would need to, would require a, a budget amendment and then the, the purchasing of whatever was authorized by council. So it may be a, a distinction without the kind of difference that you're imagining, but in any case, it would return to council for consideration of a budget amendment if we were going to consider an expenditure. So through the chair, if I may add to that, I, I think from what I've learned and understand, the distinction would be working capital, as Robin mentioned, different be difference between assets and liabilities. So it's not yet spoken for, but as David mentioned, uh, once it's a capital improvement, we have up here collectively decided how it will be used. Is, is that accurate? That's correct. I think I think the city manager just misspoke when he said working capital. It, it was designated in those bond documents is to be used for capital improvements, not yet determined what project that will be. That money is set aside in a separate fund and will come back to council um, when we decide what the project might be. Okay, so, so just, just if I'm understanding it correctly, this is, this is a, a next step once we get to capital improvement. Because again, if, it, if it's working capital, it, it, can't, it can't be used in certain ways until it gets labeled as a, as a capital improvement. So from my reading, it, it's, we're, we're already to another step. We don't Close, have, closer to be able to spending. We do not, as staff, have the authority to spend that money without coming. We cannot increase appropriations in any budget without coming to the city council for approval. Now, under under the the, the COVID emergency, though, you 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 could make expenditures without the the, the council's approval. Well, through the chair, that I guess is theoretically possible. I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, when we had the need to stand up the ambulances and the care ambulance contract, the procedures, though, would require that we return to council with that kind of a contract immediately for ratification, as was the case with the care ambulance. So it's not like there's a, a separate pool of money that we can utilized for some purpose that isn't authorized by council. It would have to be directly related to the pandemic and we would come immediately back to council for, for ratification of such an expenditure. I don't have any thinking that that would be uh, required right now. I, I, I think just uh, one, one, of the, one of the concerns uh, about um, Possibly skipping the step from working capital to to capital improvement is is one of the the auditors was uh, pointed out that uh, it was not adequately quantified the financial co consequences of budget adjustments for the city council, and so um, there there have been uh, you know a 1.6 million dollar uh, capital improvement project uh, there there was um, the the city manager. Um, uh, said for us to lead uh, when it came to the health department movement, and so I think just the the concern is that um, without that that step, that um, 
we, we aren't putting in the safeguards uh, for the spending of the money. Uh, if, so, I, if I can say something. Yes, definitely. I want to make it very clear to everybody here and all of the public out there, there has never been a $1.6 million increase without council's approval. No, I, I, I understand, uh, uh, but from the state audit report, uh, it, it, uh, it says here, did not adequately quantify the financial consequences of budget adjustments for the city council. So again, the, the audit report says that the, the, the numbers or, or the data that has been presented to council has not been adequate. And so, I, I mean, I understand that the, the council has, has made some, uh, has in, approved some spendings, um, but an outside uh, agency has pointed out that there has been, uh, I guess, a, a lack of legitimate uh, so Councilman guess, Tabata, uh, an analysis. Councilman so that, that's, that's the concern. Is there a, a specific question or specific something you'd like to address? Yes, or, yes. So, we so, understand so, the audit report. I'm sure they, they are too. Is there a question directly that you... Yeah, so, like? so just ahead. the... The, the question was that it, 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 it wasn't working capital, it's capital improvement, and I just, just want to be clear that that is, that is a, a step closer to the spending of the money. Is that, is that true? I, through the chair, I don't believe we're any step closer to spending any of that money until it appears on your agenda. But I'd like to speak to the point that was raised with respect to the state auditor's finding, which was reasonable. They gave us uh, a corrective action plan, which was, I forget, nine or ten different issue areas that the city needed to tend to. And then the big step forward after that is the financial recovery plan, which takes each one of those identified areas and comes up with SMART goals. Is it measurable? Is it achievable? What, who's it responsible for it? And that financial recovery plan will go to the finance and audit committee meeting on March the 24th and then from there we'll come to the council and from council we'll go back to the state auditor. One of the line items in that financial recovery plan will address this, will say that fiscal impact should have a, a template instead of a briefer section on the fiscal impact section of your staff reports there would be a, a template format, it hasn't been devised yet but that's one of the things on the to-do list within the financial recovery plan. So it's a, it's a valid concern, and it's being addressed through the financial recovery plan. Any other questions? Uh, Councilman Wu? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, everybody see things differently. Everybody see seeing, okay, the glass is half full or half empty. Okay, and somebody sees half empty, and somebody sees half full. So, so I want to... Okay, I, I know based on I reviewed the comprehensive annual financial financial report, I see the increase of uh, fund balance or the reserve, because I've been doing this for five years. I see previously we only decreasing our reserve. Now we increase. I think okay, uh, our finance uh, finance director should show us the comparison about what okay, uh, seventeen, eighteen, or eighteen, nineteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty, twenty one. The comparison about okay, do we? I don't know. Do we have a comparison so we can show to the resident? Okay, are we to continue to decrease or we 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 turn around? We are doing okay some kind of uh, okay adjustment. So I, I think this is something important to do a comparison compare with the previous okay and the annual report. Okay, now you have uh, this current one, and now we move into potentially okay June thirtieth of uh, okay the new. Okay, and the budget. So, so in that way, we want to see to prepare the new budget, but at the same time, we want to see the comparison. Do you have any? Through the chair, if I may, I mentioned this, and maybe we went by it too fast in the manager's report, but we have a slide, and we're going to see if Robin and or Paulina can put it up for us. But it does show that comparative in terms of unassigned general fund reserves for the last five years. Because this is what the audit, okay, state auditor, they complaining about, okay, and we our reserve continue to decrease. 
Okay, and, and the latest what we are number nine, because if we continue the trend of decrease over fund balance or reserve, then of course we have a, we will be in trouble, but we want to see the turning point. Do we, are we going to, okay, have we turned around? Okay, and this and that, so, so show us the proof. Th and uh, through the chair, thank you, Tony. That's a very good point that I was gonna bring that up too. Despite the uh, recommendations that, that we're taking seriously from the audit report, they didn't know yet that this graph would look the way it does, which I think. It, a point of information? Uh, are, he currently has the floor, so let him. Point, uh, point, point, point of information, uh, Mayor. Uh, are, are, are we in, uh, in dis discussion, de debate, or, or is this question for, for staff time? He's, I'm just I'm just more. making a comment and kind of like going kind of answering what you were asking. Um, a point of information, Mayor. It, uh, are, are are we are we going by by Robert's rules uh, for for the for the meeting or? The council could answer certain questions. Correct, City Attorney. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't see. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The Mayor recognizes him. At recognizes you then you can speak so as I was saying we're, I think we're we're turning the corner um, and it it looks a lot better than it has before so despite the challenges that I've seen year after year after year that require uh, budget amendments all the time this this is pretty positive here would you want to go ahead and Make your little mini presentation, please. If, yes, if, uh, I, if we could ask, I was going to say. Through the chair, if I could ask the finance director to review it. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. The fund balances. So the chart that's up there right now, um, you can see in uh, the unassigned fund balance, I went back five years through the audit reports. Um, it was 15 million, 100,000 basically. Um, in 1516, we spent down the reserves to 14 million 100 in 1617. In 1718, it went down 11, almost 12 million. In 1819, it went down again below um, to 10 million. And then with this current financial report, it increased by. 2.7 million almost. So you can see every single year it went down 913,500, down 2,139, down 2,100,000, ,100, and then the last one it went up in this last audit report. So I have a following question since I bring this question up. So on the, on the finance, okay, on the state auditor, Okay, based on what number regarding the issue, they based on, okay, 20, okay, 18 to 2019, right? So why, is the, why is the call of time to June 30th? Because they must have physical years of the number we provide for them. So my understanding is they provide the last will be 18 to 19. Correct. So 18 to 19 lays the previous majority, they're doing the budget. A lot of the information that the state auditors looked at was based on the previous audit that they did in 15, which was many, many years old, and uh, they so, didn't So they don't have information of uh, 19 and 20, am I right? No, we didn't have it done. Our, because our, not even actually, happening yet. Because the, some of the residents and some of the people that are also on the Finance and Audit Committee asked for the state audit. It delayed our city audit because our auditors did not want to issue this report until they read that report. So, so, so the basically the final, okay, the audit from the state auditor, the numbers only tier 18 and 19. Yes. So, so that's what they based on whether the previous, the one we end up to $9 million and continue to yield decrease. Now, if they audit us again, they see we are in the turning point because the reform, because everything we are doing over here. Am I right? Yes. Thank you. Anybody has further questions? Councilman Sabatabai. So I, I had a, uh, questions on the uh, the material weaknesses that the audit found. So uh, one one of the major ones was in in our finance department. Um, it, it mentioned uh, that 
Um, the, the city did not maintain the appropriate staffing levels within the finance department. Uh, this was a finding that um, they, they had found uh, several years in a row um, that there's been high turnover. So um, again, what, what, has, uh, what has staff done to uh, address uh, staffing? And, and if you can explain uh, why, why there's been uh, so much turnover in finance. Through the chair, if I may. Um, there's a number of indices of a city's fiscal health. We've just spent a fair amount of time talking about one. Um, the city has policies about how big this number should be in terms of unassigned general fund reserves. The GFOA, the Government Finance Office Association, recommends a minimum of two months worth of revenue be in that account. Um, the findings with respect to staffing are um, warranted. I can tell you we're understaffed in that department, as in other departments. Um, one of the concrete steps we've taken forward is to um, go through the HR commission, consolidate a couple of those positions into a higher level position, and we got um, through that process and through council approval authority to hire an assistant finance director. We've now concluded that recruitment process and made an offer. So we'll have another person of a very high caliber um, to give our director some much needed assistance. Another piece of that is the city's um, electronic financial accounting software is on its last legs. We're going to need to look at that uh, quite soon as well. Councilman Wu had a, oh, you want, oh, Councilman yeah. Lots of way. So, so uh, I, when, when it, one of the, the concerns is because uh, in the in the audit it, it did uh, in in the the state audit from from earlier, uh, it found that we had not developed a comprehensive plan with clear timelines, monitoring, and reporting to improve city long term financial health. And the, I guess my my question is, now that we have. Uh, made the decision to push forward with uh, creating our, our own health department uh, is our staffing model for finance are we taking into account uh, the number of staffers that we are also going to have to increase in order to meet uh, this uh, brand new department that we are um, planning to put up uh, and then the second question was um, how how did the uh, I guess because this the city manager um, you know led council to believe that we would be able to do this, so how did that fit in this comprehensive plan uh, that uh, I believe on March first you had said that you were you were going to have that out for us uh, so did, does that uh, march first long term plan uh, that you are going to be delivering to us um, include uh, the health department. The state audit report recommended two related but distinct steps. One was the corrective action plan and one was the financial recovery plan. The financial recovery plan has been drafted. It's been uh, reviewed, it's currently being modified, and it'll be presented to the Finance and Audit Committee at their March 24th meeting. From there, it'll return to Council. One of the pieces of that is the issue we talked about earlier, which is any item involving budgeting or expenditures will have to have a fiscal impact section. You haven't seen that yet. It hasn't been presented yet with respect to any department, including the proposed health department. And then are we anticipating increasing staffing in the finance department um, beyond uh, what we've originally um, had as a, as a model uh, for our staffing uh, considering the new department? Not with regards to the new department. Um, during this COVID time and my um, staff being out to homeschool their children, went out on maternity leave, the city council authorized me to overfill those positions because that took all my accountants out of the building. Basically, I was the only accountant left. And um, we have 
um, overfilled those positions with two new people. And um, I'm planning on continuing that into um, the new budget year. Um, it was much needed to have more accounting staff. And um, even with the adjustments that I've made with the reductions that have been made since I've been here in the last two years, um, there's still savings. It's not an increase. Go ahead, Councilman Will. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Council Member Tapai Tapai. Okay, uh, okay uh, since I'm a little bit longer over here, so I went through the previous management, and uh, it's true. Okay, it, the turnaround on the finance department is like crazy. It's like, okay, roll the door, okay, and uh, certainly we have a new finance director. Okay, and then we asking question over here, okay, they cannot even answer. And I, I want to say this because the mismanagement from previous, okay, our management team, so we have all this issue, and, and the, the, that's what the finance, okay, on state audit is based on 1819. And that's why we have a lot of problems. The problem is unbearable, okay, and each department all have that baggage and the unstable personnel. Okay, and especially finance director, I don't know how many they changed, three, four, five, during the three years. So, seven? Okay, I, I'm, I'm totally lose count because every time, okay, here, then, then the previous city, city manager introduced, so this is your finance director. I said, holy micro, another one? So where is the previous one? So it's disappeared, okay, it disappeared like, like this. So, so I just want to thank, okay, our current team because you have a two, almost two years. Okay, and uh, I know you work seven days a lot of time, and uh, you don't have to do this, but because you really want to help us. But I know you can go to retirement, this and that, but uh, I, I see the turnaround, I see the hard work, I see you build a system, okay, compared with the previous, what I see the previous, okay, finance director, so-called finance director is not even qualified for that. Even me, I can see they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, so, so, so for that, the really, really changing improvement, okay, that's why a good, when the management team doesn't work, you change a new management because you want to improve. And the stable of a professional staff is, improve, is very important for our city future. And so, so that's why we can see the number turn around because the, the dedication, okay, and for our staff are working on our, this very tough, stressful time and we can still turn around. So I really cannot say more because I want to see more increase of our bond, uh, bond balance. I want to see more increase of our okay, reserve, and I want to see more of our, hopefully not reduce service, but we are going to in much more, okay, and uh, financial sum, okay, so we can build from that foundation for our future generation to come. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Batsby. So uh, an another one of the, the material weaknesses was on uh, our uh, lack of uh, having a consistent uh, person with the CEFA. Uh, th these are uh, expenditures, federal awards, grants, things like that. Uh, and again, it, it pointed out to the, the high turnover in staff. So again, much of the, the this new department uh, is, is uh, much of the funding come, is going to come through through grants. So uh, this this material weakness. Uh, how, how has the city manager? Uh, how how have you uh, addressed that that weakness and, and feel confident that that's going to be something that uh, is is no longer uh, going to be an issue. Uh, especially considering the amount of grants um, we are uh, now looking um, to fund uh, this new department. I can answer if you'd like me to, manager. Well, I'm going to let Robin answer, but first I'd like to say, as we discuss in the staff report, um, we are presenting this evening through the city's independent auditing firm, a RAM, Rogers, Anderson, Malady, and Scott, an unmodified, clean opinion on the city's financial statements. In any organization, there's always things that you could do differently or better, and this audit represents a chance for us to be aware of some of those things. But um, a, a, 
a clean opinion is, is a very important thing for us to have achieved. And I'm going to ask Robin to speak to the question substantively. So preparation of the CIFA, which is part of the single audit, um, the person that's been doing that has been here for two years. Um, I have addressed, um, it's a personnel issue, I've addressed it with the new assistant finance director, has a lot of experience in this area. So I, all of these findings, I'm, um, that'll be one of the first things that we do is make changes to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You, uh, th thank you for that, Robin. Uh, again, uh, I, I, I think the concern is these, these are, uh, material weaknesses uh, in in staffing that that was was found. I, I guess a, a question for for the city manager is um, how how do the audits um, inform your your decision making, your long term planning? Uh, I know as a as a as a football coach, uh, I do what, what's called self scouting. So I have some some expert coaches of mine watch all our film. I guess that would be like an audit. And they, they share with me weaknesses, things like that, uh, to then make those changes and improvements. So for, for you, when you get these audit reports, uh, how does it inform your view of the organization? I think there's a number of indices of um, fiscal health. We talk about this in the staff report. What, what this firm has done is presented fairly their opinion of that health. And the opinion that they've given us is the, is the very best opinion that a city can receive from its auditors. Um, I know we're now in the world of numbers, but in this city hall, we're, we're in the people business. I remember when I first got here a couple of years ago, the relationship with this very same auditing firm and our finance and audit committee, I would characterize it in that moment as a little rocky. There was some shouting going on, and the auditors were offended and the auditors left. Um, that absolutely wasn't the case um, last week at the meeting of the Finance and Audit, probably the best Finance and Audit Committee meeting we've had. And we, we thanked them for their professional approach. I'm not so sure it's their approach that changed, but maybe our um, dealing with the issues honestly and our, our response to them. Um, we, we talked about this issue of turnover. I can tell you one of the ways to avoid turnover is to treat our professional staff courteously and fairly and decently and well and, um, and thank them for acceptable behavior. And I really think that that is, is called for given that we've, we may not be entirely out of the woods, but I feel like we've definitely turned a corner and with this report um, are, are publicly evidencing that we've made really good gain in, in these areas. So I wouldn't use this as an um, indictment of the city, but rather just a snapshot of where the city is in terms of its financial management. And I think it's, um, it's a clean opinion, and it speaks well of the good work that's been occurring. So, so then you, you would not agree with the material weakness that we are uh, severely understaffed in, in our finance department and... Uh, in in other other areas of of city hall, I know one of the significant deficiencies uh, talks about no documentation, um, late reports, uh, and th those types of things. So so again, as you know, someone who who gets the audit uh, and then looks at the audit we got uh, at the beginning of the year, I, I guess I, I'm asking which which sections of the audit should should we should we follow? I mean, you're, I'm you're sorry. It's just um, this is for CAF for uh, for the year ending June 30th, 2020. Correct? Okay. I, I know you're asking a lot of detailed questions. I mean, if you can, you could more than welcome to have a meeting. I know that the audit and finance committee um, will be meeting as well. A lot of the uh, audit findings uh, they did discuss and that they, they said that they are going to um, 
they are going through that whole thing and giving recommendations and so forth, including our audit, finance and audit committee. So I just, you know, if it's in regards to this June 30th, 2020, I mean, we could go on. We know the previous administration had that many changes. I remember coming in with a finance director previously, and I remember Jim Grivich here uh, when they were making the presentation, and she could not answer a simple question of how much money we had in the account. The whole audience, the whole council was just like in disbelief. Um, so that was the previous finance director. I know our current finance director, she works very hard, diligent. If you go to her office, it's, you know, piles organized of lots of documents on her board. It has all the numbers up there. It's like, you know, the genius E equals MC squared type of deal. She has a lot of things there. She works seven days a week. I know they're working really hard. They are having, a, a, hopefully we're going to have a new finance assistant to assist with that and um, with hopefully with the finance and audit committee to assist her and I hope you guys can as well that we can fix all that but this is for the uh, CAFR for the year and June 30 2020 Ma madam madam mayor uh, if I could respond, would, to say uh, the motion to approve please madam um, madam mayor second. okay I'll second well uh, roll we, call please are we going to debate the motion your attorney to debate, debate the motion. Any discussion on the motion? We, we have a discussion on the motion. motion. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, just, just uh, wanted to uh, mention, uh, a, a, again, when, when, it, when it comes to the, to, to the CAFR, uh, the CAFR did state some, some material weaknesses uh, that when we were uh, proposed a, a, a major plan on February 23rd, uh, again, the, these were not um, these were not areas that were were discussed or or, or even when asked about um, were relayed to council. And, and again, one of the concerns is that uh, the, the city manager not adequately quantifying the financial consequences of our decision making. And so questions like staffing, like how much staffing are we going to need in finance department? How, many, how much staffing are we going to need in HR? Cost of a uh, health department director. Uh, again, uh, the uh, amount of uh, money that potentially could be gotten back from the county or no money gotten back from the county. Uh, again, one of the things is, is this, the city manager that we as a council we, we count on the city manager to, to be honest with us, to give us numbers. I understand, you know, the idea of, of we're in the people business, um, but we're also the, the stewards of, of, of the money, and, and numbers, numbers are, are important. And so, again, when we are up here on the dais, uh, I, I'm asking a lot of questions that I receive from, from residents. Uh, I've gotten emails from residents. And so these questions are not just for me. They, they actually are, are not for me. They're questions that residents wanted asked. They wanted the city manager to respond to. They're, they're interested in, in these answers, uh, as you know, uh, all of us uh, are. And so this is why I've, I've asked these questions. An individual meeting with just me doesn't serve the public. Those questions that you can ask, at least to give them a heads up to pull reports, pull certain numbers, because they won't know the numbers off on top of their head. They have to go through things. It can also be put in as a request, as a presentation to be made, so they can discuss and go further with all these things. But currently, I'm so, so so the, these uh, it was agendized that we were going to have the um, again the the quarterly uh, budget and and the CAFR. They were on the agenda. I. Uh, there was a finance and audit meeting, so I, I did not realize that uh, the questions I was asking of the city manager were, were going to be uh, questions okay. that he wouldn't. Oh, okay. Have I think we should for. just have a roll call, please, because otherwise we wouldn't stay here till no. tomorrow. Uh, roll call. Councilmember Tabatabai. Aye. Councilman Wu. Aye. Councilwoman Diaz. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Castellanos? Aye. Mayor Lopez Viado? Aye. Motion approves 5 0. On to item number six, pulled by Councilmember Mayor Pro Tem Castellanos. Proceed, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, for this, I'd like to uh, see do we have MV Transit in attendance? MV Transportation? Oh, we got Kelly McDonald.
Mayor and Council, Kelly McDonald's going to give a brief staff report. I could even. Is the representative also here? Just yeah, I know you'll be giving the staff report because I have a lot of questions as well. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, it's uh, locked up and I don't know his password. Okay, thank, thank you for your patience. Good evening. Uh, this item uh, concerns the consideration of extensions to uh, transportation and lease agreements with MV Transportation. MV provides um, two, uh, two modalities of uh, transportation services for us. Uh, the fixed, fixed route shuttle is, is one. Uh, Shuttle consists of three alignments, red, blue, and green line, and um, all the lines um, comprise approximately 40 miles of route, and there are 136 stops. Uh, operates Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 7, uh, and the contracted annual operating hours for the shuttle service are 11,650. A fare for... Um, Fare for boarding is $1.50 for seniors. This is the blue line, which, uh, which services the western portion of the city. That runs uh, counterclockwise. The red line serves the uh, eastern portion, runs clockwise. The green line runs north and south and serves the uh, southern end of the uh, city, running all the way down to Valley and Centus. Uh, dial ride runs Monday through Friday from uh, 8 to 5.30 and Sunday 8 to 2.30. It's a uh, contracted annual hours of operation for the servicer, 7,600 hours. Uh, uh, it's a dollar per boarding and 50 cents per boarding for seniors. Uh, the transit Transit agreement with MV was approved in December 2003, uh, effective March 3rd, 2014. Total cost of the agreement was just uh, uh, less than uh, $5 million. There's a uh, provision for two optional one-year extensions awarded on a, a one-year basis. The most recent was approved in, uh, on uh, March 3rd, 2020. That was the sex, sex, uh, second optional year. And as... During that uh, discussion last year, uh, we talked about uh, the need for evaluation of various things, services, offered the alignments, uh, destinations, a ridership. Unfortunately, two weeks later, due to COVID, much of everything was closed down. Uh, city facilities, schools, libraries closed to the public. And uh, while transportation is considered a, an essential service, public transportation, we maintained a status quo service, as have other neighboring agencies that uh, we've surveyed. There was a significant decrease in ridership as a result of, uh, of the pandemic and the shutdown. And again, as neighboring, neighboring agencies have experienced, the uh, planned evaluation has been postponed. Um, we still intend to do that uh, and reviewing RFPs that uh, other cities have used and, and have received metro approval to fund that uh, evaluation uh, activity once we move forward with that. Uh, ridership um, was a concern last time, and uh, in the last year's report presented the 1819 fiscal year uh, ridership. Uh, in this report, it included the 1920, uh, 1920 fiscal year as well. And that's uh, shown in attachment three. 
Uh, this slide is updated to show the uh, first half of the fiscal year of uh, 2021. The same is true of the uh, dial ride this slide. So we'd asked uh, MV to, staff asked MV to provide a uh, proposal for a month-to-month -month extension. Uh, we'd received three options at various levels of, of service. Staff's recommending the uh, third option uh, for the lo lower rates and the status quo, um, status quo uh, operating hours. The uh, totals shown are annualized and maximized at the current contracted operating hours. The uh, city's invoice for actual operating hours at an hourly rate. The shuttle, which is a fixed route um, and runs on a schedule, uh, results in a pretty consistent cost. The uh, dial -a ride is demand-driven, and the less demand, you, less than planned demand, uh, you have less than planned expenditures, and that's what we've experienced, particularly this year. In the next table have the uh, current year and the past three years, which show, uh, which compare the uh, contractual commitments to the actual expenditures. And in each of those years, the uh, actual expenditures have been, have underspent the commitments this year significantly. And uh, th um, the last column for 2021 is through 11 months of the contract. Um, and these, the increased rates that are proposed in the extension will be sustained by the, uh, are expected to be as sustained by the approved budget through, throughout 2021 uh, without amendment. And uh, the balance of the extension would be included in the 2021, uh, 2022 proposed budget. The second part of the report is the uh, lease agreement. Um, MV uh, leases space on the, at the city yard to host a, um, a mobile office and uh, park the uh, vehicles. The city is receiving 27, well, the original agreement was $2,700 per month. Uh, the agreement's been amended twice, once to uh, provide additional parking spaces and another time to coincide with a transit agreement. Currently, the city's receiving $3,000 a month as part of this lease and it's recommended that uh, this be extended on a month-to-month -month basis can, with, the, uh, with the transportation um, agreement. The options, the city council has the options to um, either accept the uh, staff's recommendation or provide an alternative direction. The uh, recommendation is that the city council approve the amendments to extend the transit lease and uh, transportation agreements with MV Transit effective March 3rd, 2021 on a month-to-month -month basis. That concludes my report and happy to answer questions and representatives from uh, MV are here as well. Thank you, Thank you Madam Mayor. Thank you, Kelly, for that presentation. Uh, as far as the option number three, the cheapest one, how does that compare to last year's cost? I'm sorry, do you have Ask again, please. Uh, the, the cheapest option, uh, the lowest rev rate per hour. Um, how does that compare to last year's cost? Is it flat? Has it gone up? It's it's about a 12 percent increase. 12 percent increase. Okay, so if, if we could invite MV Transportation up, as I mentioned last year, my concern with with these buses is that they're ghost buses, they're mm -hmm. phantom buses. Every time I drive by one, I, I cheer when I see one head in them. Um, the numbers speak for themselves. So what I'd like to do is ask MV Transport if they could um, come up with something better, analyze e not, not only the routes, but the different times of day. If something's not working, I think we should consider uh, that's, that's what the plan of, of the evaluation of the routes was intended to do and to inform the next RFP. And we intend, we intend to do that. We'd like to have a third party uh, conduct that evaluation. That's, that's fine. Uh, one of my concerns is I asked for that to occur a year ago, which is why I asked for this month to month now, because I don't think it's being taken seriously. 
And in, in addition to that, what question is, as far as the, the cost of the analysis, can we use funds from um, Measure M to, to fund that third-party analysis? Yes. Okay. So, well, we, we actually received some additional Prop A money as a result of uh, some reporting that was done, and I've, I've gotten approval from MTA to, to use that, that funding for this purpose. Okay, good. That, that, that sounds great. I, as I said last year, my concern is just, um, j just because it's special earmarked money doesn't mean we should just be okay with burning it because it is tax money. So I really want to push hard for it. let's put some brain cells together and let's really provide a service to the resident. I don't think it does anybody in the city a service to just say, well, there it is. We're spending your money on buses. Oh, never mind the fact that they're empty. And last time we talked about this, something I learned is that the vast majority of people simply don't know it's available for their use. I think we still need to potentially focus on that. And if that doesn't work, reallocating these funds maybe to subsidize Ubers or Lyfts or whatever, let's let the market speak. Let's let the residents tell us how they would best like to utilize uh, this tax money. Right. Und understood. Um, the, the challenge with this past year has been that everything's been been closed. Def definitely. That, that's going to skew the, the way um, people act, but, but I think we should uh, strive to be adaptive. I mean, whether it's in pandemic times or re back to regular times, I think we should have a goal of uh, spending these tax dollars in the best way possible and not limit ourselves to uh, very long time frames to reassess. Agreed. Um, last year we talked about uh, doing some marketing through, through events as, as well as uh, the schools and so forth. But again, we, our yeah, with events went down. They did make, it to the, did make it to the senior center before it shut down. And uh, so there were, were efforts made and, and there just weren't opportunities beyond with the, with the lockdown. Uh, we, we did post to social media and uh, post, post on, the, on the buses as well. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we could ask Athens and come up with some other ideas for how to spread the word that we're asking these questions. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all I've got. That's the main thing I wanted to emphasize. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Are they actually here today? Yes, they are. Can they come up, please? Yes, they are. And uh, um, Genevieve Lira, who's the operations manager, Steve Allen is the general manager. They represent the operation. So you can utilize the microphone individually if you'd like. And Judy Smith, who's a regional vice president. So people uh, represent the Check. operation. Check. Portion of it. Uh, costing Check. was done through Check. the headquarters in uh, Dallas. So um, if there are operation questions, they can answer Check. them. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So out of you three, which one were you here last year when I had a lot of questions? You both were here? Three. All three of us were here. You, oh, y'all three of you. Well, thank you. Welcome back. Greatly appreciate it. Um, with all those questions that, you know, the council, or especially me at that time because I'm passionate, I used to take the public transportation and I know the need, what have you done since then? Well, um, our plan was to do a lot of outsourcing with schools because that was one of the things that was brought up, reaching out to schools, reaching out to the senior center. And unfortunately, um, when after we had our meeting, um, the next week, within like a few days, we were out at the senior center um, doing a lot of outreach with you know the seniors that were there. Um, it was really responsive. Um, we were able to sign up a lot of people, people who didn't know about the program, um, people that are outside of the city that were utilizing the senior center were, you know, finding out, you know, um, information about not just us, but their own city. Um, we were helping them, you know, um, gather information. And um, a week after we did that, that's when the pandemic hit and we were hit very hard. Not just um, the senior center was shut down, but schools shut down, which impacted us greatly because a lot of our ridership is dependent on the kids that you know utilize the bus Did to get to school. Did you come? Would you be closer? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is this one? Is this better? Okay. Um, 
so that was one of the hardest things that uh, that happened so like this okay so so our plan was to do a lot of outreach um you know passing out flyers at the parks and the schools and all these things but when they shut down we really had no other option um we continued to provide service because we are essential and we do still have regular riders we did we did we do still have people who use dial a ride on a regular basis because you know dialysis and those centers they they don't shut down so we had to figure out a way to stay safe and keep people safe um, on our buses you know through the pandemic so we're still waiting for the senior center to reopen we're still waiting for children to go back to school so we can continue our efforts of outreach and letting people know who we are and that we're here to to provide a service okay and so uh can you remind me the shuttle and dial ride um so the shuttle is only within west covina correct yes and then the dial ride what's their perimeter or three what's miles it? outside but only for medical three miles outside so have they been utilizing especially our seniors with the vaccination have they been utilizing that because i know like the major vaccination is in pomona in la right. you don't travel take our seniors there because i know they don't have transportation with family members to take them right if, if the city were to request us to do so and we were to you know i would be asked to set something up then of course yeah we we would be able to do something like that but right now we're primarily um just with what we have been given what's within our contract which is just providing service within the city for any essential needs any needs that they need and then you know continuing to provide service three miles outside for medical okay um well i mean you touched on the students which i'm i'm glad you're you know that that was a key element like i said i, I used the bus when i was young and yeah so did i it's full it passed me and i walked 45 minutes to my high school so i i know that that's a need especially those um who need to work and don't have transportation uh, so it's currently still being operated correct yes we haven't stopped operating um unfortunately a lot of the outreach that we had planned which were going to be at the i think it was the green day we had talked about um doing a transit fair we talked about doing where we kind of park a bus out and then hand out informational flyers and kind of just really you know push and get the word out all those things came to a halt um we would still love the opportunity to be able to provide those services for you guys um because we we do have a lot of information we'd love to provide and what can you do to ease uh residents from utilizing these services because of covid fear you know it's enclosed i don't know what your ventilation is or yes. the cleanliness or you know that they won't with social distancing how do you do social yeah. distancing in there and how do you, you know can you explain that a lot of a lot of that um can be found we have informational um notices that we put up on the buses we do have cleaning logs all that all those things that we we follow very strict guidelines from the cdc so we do um social distance in a bus we have you know limited you know you know kind of um taped off seats so that way people aren't sitting too close you know there are mandatory masks being used um we have wipes and disinfectants and things like that for people if they feel the need to have it um we have taken a lot of you know um of the CDC guidelines and really made them our own because we do transport seniors and they are as we know a very sensitive um group so we have to make sure that we keep them safe while on our buses and and that has been our priority since this pandemic and they sanitize yes yeah. yes uh, multiple times a day and um high touch points and all those things and you are looking at rerouting cuz i i remember i believe it was i know when last year i i think it was the blue blue line that was extremely low so that, like that is still our biggest struggling line is the blue line um that one just for whatever reason i don't know if there is like a, a center out there that has moved but that has been our most struggling line um red line was right along with the blue line especially with the shutdown of the mall um that just really wasn't bringing in a lot of people anymore but um in the past month we've seen an increase of about 100 passengers so i think with more vaccines being provided people are feeling a little bit more safe to come out um 
because they feel maybe a little bit more protected. But, you know, the mall is back open now. So, you know, we hope to see uh, more steady trends going up as vaccines are being provided. Okay. Um, did other councils have other questions? Uh, oh, real quick, do you guys have Instagram for, for the service? As, as a private company, MV, we do. However, for the city of West Covina, that's not something that we manage. We don't manage. Would you a, a guys consider media. initiating one? As, as a, I mean, you mentioned the difficulty this year of outreach. Um, I think that would have been effective. I, I agree. I agree with you. Um, doing could, social could we media, a lot of that and get a response because I think that would be so easy. I mean, I could think of a lot of ideas that I. I mean, if I were a driver and I just saw it empty, I'd be like, <laughs> you know, I'm parking right here, just door hangers. <laughs> hey my bus yeah I, I think I mean, social media is a really powerful tool and if that's something that the city wants us to look into we're more than happy to do so uh, we just want the permission to kind of work with the city on that absolutely we'll discuss that yeah that would be great did, did either one of you would like to speak I mean Genevieve did such a great job <laughs> thank you <laughs> she's our, our person on the ground uh, in West Covina has been here for a number of years and she does a great job but uh, I just want to say from uh, our company we appreciate the opportunity to continue to work with the city um, this contract is month to month and uh, I've been in talks with Kelly on uh, some possible uh, changes and things we can do a little differently that would uh, we, that he may bring back to you later but uh, we are looking forward to us opening back up and being able to uh, you know, get the data we need to to do uh, to provide some uh, information that's going to be sufficient to make sure that we give you the best opportunity in, uh, in transportation for the city. So we appreciate that. Uh, I, when I walked up tonight, I was like a year ago. A year ago, this went really fast. This pandemic uh, hit us, and this this year has gone by really fast. But we do see some light at the end of the tunnel, and we're looking forward to uh, opening up and, and continuing to work with the city this time. We are taking care of our, our residents or those who, especially that medical or COVID vaccination and testing, they're, you guys are all taking care of them. Yes, we, we, do, we do our best. We have great drivers who care about the residents and, and the, the passengers who've been riding for a number of years. So we, we appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Sure. Just a, a clarifying question. I, be, I believe the mayor asked it, but uh, so, so you did say that if, if we needed uh, transportation to, to some of those major vaccination sites, especially for, for our seniors, uh, we would be able to have that done at the us. city's request. Yes. Okay. Yes. I wonder how that would work because I know vaccination site, the drive time, one. Yes. To, you know, to travel and then the wait time, two. Yes. So, I mean, they could spend half. I could, if I may, Madam Mayor, interrupt there. Um, I think, well, as part of what I'm discussing of just being creative, I would say for, let's say, a special project like that that would serve our seniors, we could take the most underutilized line and take it offline that day in favor of let's load it up with seniors and take them to wherever. That's right. the kind of creative. I mean, this is a silly one, but I just thought of it now. You know, what what gets more attention than the ice cream man coming down the street? We could play a little song <laughs> I got, gotcha no but then, then people actually wait yeah. what's that bus <laughs> yeah we, we would we would be we would definitely like to look at that um, some of the other cities that I have oversight uh, with uh, are looking at those very um, situations and the challenge as you spoke about is the drive time the wait time but you know in order to get our seniors vaccinated you know we'll keep that driver there with them so they can do a, a drive-through and, and get their vaccinations and just as a point of reference, I'll check, I'll find out for sure, but I know uh, the uh, Dodger Stadium was looking at an express lane for seniors that would be um, coming potentially in a group to uh, get their vaccinations. Uh, so uh, we'll take a look at that and provide the information to Kelly. I do, I do like Mayor Pro Tem's uh, idea of, you know, all of them in a shuttle. But go ahead, Councilman Wu. Do they allow a bus of a senior to go to get vaccinated? Okay, I don't know. Normally now I see the pictures, nothing but a single car and a two-person husband wife. Yes, we are working with so the city of Los Angeles. Are that. we allowed to bus? Because we try to do for the Bridge Creek senior, mm -hmm. okay, and the, the difficulty is a 
the senior, some of the seniors, uh, the mobility issue. So I don't know <coughs> your bus equipped some of uh, the handicap ramp so they can, okay, the issue, and uh, then we have to arrange, okay, okay the, the site allow we bus people there. So, so we need to see that it's a possibility. I think this is a good idea, but we need to that logistic, okay, see how we do it. Right. At the same time, you don't want people like tremble together without social distance, especially senior. And we would have to, on the shuttle, we would have to identify, just like you have taped off seats, we will let you know the maximum number of people we can take so that we are safe, that we keep the seniors safe on their travels to and from uh, the vaccination uh, center. And but, but I think this is a good idea, see if we yes. can logistically, okay, put this, okay, because I'm, on my understanding, a lot of seniors live by themselves. It's really difficult to register themselves and plus have a transportation and to get vaccine. So if we can do something, okay, and our community service, since we deliver a lot of food, can find out, okay, who wanted, who needed, we can help them now and they kind of help them to get vaccinated. Get okay, so to be. And uh, um, like we were working with the city of Los Angeles right now on that uh, very project. And uh, I can get with Kelly and we can get uh, some connection there on how, they, how they're gone about uh, getting those, uh, number one, those appointments kind of together, right, grouped together. And um, once again, they're, they're looking at having an express lane for, uh, the, um, for the vaccination um, uh, seniors yeah, at, at Dodger Stadium. So uh, we'll work together and get that information pulled together and see how we can work to get them. I think the best idea is if we can get a vaccination site in West Covina. Them, that would be ideal. That would be much easier. <laughs> that would be ideal. Okay, to take our senior to there, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, because right now we hit the obstacle, okay, we allow the county help to give us the site. So if we can have a site, then hopefully this is all resolved because we can easily, within one mile, three miles, okay, five miles to put them uh, to get this thing done in no time. Uh, but I, I, can I say something? Okay, I, I think, okay, um, Mass transportation is very important to city, okay, action, transportation, okay, plan. And I think we need to have a overall to see the full hill transit, okay, and the go west, okay, the dial right, and then maybe even Lyft or Uber, okay. So we need to kind of all together to kind of put a map and it would to decide what would be the best for the city, for the people to utilize, okay, and this service because exactly we do not want to waste okay and the the, the, the gas the, the the taxpayer all that kind of thing i think important we can kind of uh, put everything together to make sure then we get the, the most okay out of this so so anyway and maybe i don't know how soon we can get i know we are going to do a month to month at the same time about the route okay you can see how to begin the north and south we have a very lengthy north and south okay from almost the 210 to 60. So because from San Bernardino Road, goes south to the valley, that is all West Covina. So I don't know, I know we have east and west, we have a north and south to help the south side to come north, okay, north side going down to south. Yes, you want to say something? Oh, okay, so, 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 so maybe, okay, creative thinking, try to find a most, or from, okay, Shadow Oak Senior, Okay, the okay, community center to go to our senior center so we maybe have uh, some route for people can utilize in the, when we, after pandemic, so when we senior want to come out, we can provide something much more easier for them to travel. Because we know the <coughs> west, okay, for them to go to senior center in Cortez is pretty far. And the same thing south side too. Okay, but I saw you over there all the time because I was there helping out to give out the food and last year, so, so I see you, you've been taking care of uh, some of uh, our residents, and I even have uh, staff to discuss with you and the resident what would be easier, okay, the most popular to utilize, because they're waiting for your bus. Yes. I saw it in front of a senior center. So, okay, so hopefully we can have all this kind of uh, information so we can put it together, okay, so you guys can continue service us, and we can get the best of uh, the service uh, utilize all this program. I know this is from the restricted fund, the major M, this and that, but still we don't want to waste the money. Make sense? Yes, oh yes, for sure. And I'm sure the, when they do the evaluation, they'll probably do surveys to the public as well on, on what we do today. And uh, so I'm sure that'll, that'll work itself out. Um, 
when Kelly gets a, uh, actually a vendor who will do the uh, actual analysis, but we'll work hand in hand with them through the process. So my last question would be how soon we will have this, okay, and uh, put on the agenda, okay, including the new route, okay, including the service, maybe get the estimation time? Mm. Well, if, if we want to um, move forward, we, um, it's concerning about um, things opening up. We would want to th see things open up a little bit more, I, I think. And, but it, it's at the council's uh, uh, discretion. And Kelly, I understand, okay, we're waiting for the open up. But before you open it up, can we design or work on some kind of, uh, okay, okay and, yeah, outreach and uh, to survey, okay, why it would be easier for them to utilize the service rather than when we, after we open, then we start to do the survey, then we have to delay. Mm -hmm. So if you can prepare, look like, Okay, possible we're going to open because right, we, we can, have purple we can to move red. forward. We so, move. so hopefully, but we don't know during the fall time, are we going to shut down again? Uh, hopefully not. But the point is how we kind of, uh, okay, work on the kind of uh, prepare outreach before, okay, and uh, really hopefully everything open up, okay, then we can right away have people to utilize. Because if you really open it up and really, okay, and uh, people have a confidence and hopefully don't have this virus anymore, okay, and people will come out. They really want to come out, okay. They really have been, okay, suffocate for one year. So, so meaning a lot of people maybe will utilize this service. Okay, thank you. Even if you do open it up, um, the numbers are not going to change because based on your lines, every year it probably shows the same line being the lowest ridership. So you already have data from the previous years. So that alone can assist you in creating something that can show. I mean, we know we have different developments that occurred in the city uh, that shows more people will be populating in that area. I, I know you mentioned that the last study that was done, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago? Um, when was the last study oh, I done? Don't know. Uh, uh, the, the last uh, modifications to the line were, lines were about yes. uh, 2001, yeah, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and a lot has changed in yes. 20 years. I mean, <laughs> The city of West Covina has changed. I was still very young. So, um, me, me too. <laughs> you do have the data. You do know what, um, what, where heavy population areas of the city are. That you can also start in utilizing to create something. And I'd like to see something. Um, I would like to see creativity on how, you know, we, I know we discussed last year how the perception of the bus, uh, many people feel unsafe, when, especially now with COVID, it's even worse. But, you know, these are the things that, we want to see of how to ease and, and make sure not only saving money, but that our people that need it gets to use it and they don't have to walk a far walk or, you know, don't even bother because it's along the bus stop location. So that, that you guys can start on that. Um, I don't know how long, but I know if we do have this put out in a year, if we revisit this in a year, like this year I was expecting to see something. That's why I asked you, what have you done since then? But, you know, you had the, the data before. I'd like to see something next time around when you come uh, to the council to present with the bus stop routes. We can, so, can move forward with developing a, a draft RFP that would include an outreach component. Uh, I've seen, seen some, some of those, um, I think, from the release of a, a, an RFP to an award that's looking at probably a couple of months. Uh, the, the, um, the durations that I've seen of, of these evaluations range anywhere from four to six months. I've seen one go up to a year, but I'm thinking would four to six months would probably suffice. Um, but uh, we'll start working on that, and if we could release that and get uh, get the outreach component moving forward. Okay, I'd like to see it move forward, and and in one year's time, which will probably go quick again, I'd like to see yeah. this brought up and mm -hmm. uh, take uh, go forward. You, Councilman, we've had a question. You are very generous. One year, okay. Well, once we said four to six months. I want, to, <laughs> I want to get down three, three months. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. One year too long. Or six, or give us okay. a six month and update. Yeah, uh huh. Right. Uh, I think three months. <clears throat> three months come up some kind of decide. plan. Okay, <laughs> one year too long. Okay, when you I'm too old. Okay, but okay. So I think three months. Uh, but but okay. Uh, before I'm okay, want to move a motion to approve. Okay, for months to months. The gentleman, you want to say something since you're here. All I want to say is that I'm uh, very optimistic about, you know, 
the future, the next couple of months, I really think, I don't know whether you've, obviously you've seen in the news, I was watching the news this morning, and in Florida, there's a rush of seniors going to empty hotels, yes. spring break, all that sort of stuff, vaccinated seniors that are getting out and getting about. And I really think that that's going to happen in the next month to at least by the end of the summer for sure that we'll see significant, I think, increases in. So you need to hurry up to get a plan. Yeah. All right. Three months will be too long. You want to make it shorter? Well, hopefully then in a month or two. Anytime you're ready, we're ready for you. Yep. So I move the motion to approve. But prior, I just want to make sure that uh, we can make sure we take care of our seniors. Because I know we requested COVID vaccine in our city, and we were hoping that we would have got it, but we didn't get it. So Yeah. Just so you know, we do for my contract in Norwalk. <clears throat> they have a vaccine center in, in, the, in the city, and we are doing... Um, transfers for it, but like Judy says, it is kind of difficult with, you know, because you have to wait in line and all that kind of stuff. But like she said, they're they're ge they're gearing towards a, a a drive through type situation, which might make it a lot easier. And if we can do it safely, social distancing and so forth, we could, you know, share ride shuttle buses to a, you know, a vaccination site and so forth. And what was the consensus of having you return? Uh, I think three months. Okay. And and uh, but see, I want to say one thing over here. Yeah. You just say Norwalk has a vaccination center, okay? I th yes, and we are bigger than Norwalk, and we don't even have. And Norwalk, because they have a county office over there, okay, recording office. So, so I think we need to request, okay, and uh, vaccination centers, okay, in the big city of West Covina, so you can serve them to get a, okay, vaccine so they can feel safe and come out to take more of your bus. Right. So, so I think, okay, I say three months, okay, to bring back to us. So a uh, motion to approve months to months. Okay, hopefully we can give you a long contract. I will second the motion, and uh, I, I'm confident we could make all of that happen with putting some brain cells together. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilmember Tabatabai? Aye. Councilman Wu? Aye. Councilwoman Diaz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Castellanos? Aye. Mayor Lopez Viado. Aye. Motion approves, 5-0. Okay, so we have department regular matters. Item seven, um, Mr. City Manager, who will present the update? Okay, good evening, Mayor, Council, what's left of our viewing audience here. Uh, <laughs> today we'll be giving an update on the uh, homeless issues that we face here in uh, West Covina. We have invited some of our partners uh, to join in with us via Zoom, so they will be uh, presenting some information at the end. Uh, today the presentation is going to be presented by Lieutenant Brian Daniels, he's been with the department for 20 years, he's got 23 years of law enforcement. But more importantly, he's been dealing with our homeless issues for the past several years, and he's well versed in it. So he will be presenting the uh, presentation today. Brian Daniels. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council and staff, and residents of West Covina. Hopefully, I can uh, give a presentation that will maybe enlighten some of the residents and some of the questions they may have. So our HOPE staff, HOPE stands for uh, Homeless Outreach Parks Enforcement. Our HOPE was established in 2017, and we established it with two officers and a supervisor to oversee the program. We currently have one officer. His name is Officer Ling, and I still oversee the program. So in the past 10 months that Officer Ling's been assigned to this unit, he's outreached to 1,153 homeless throughout the city. He's made uh, that many contacts and approximately three to four arrests monthly as well as four to five citations issued on a, uh, on a monthly basis as well. We pulled up a map over uh, for 2020 and we've had approximately 3,700 calls for service for incidents related to homeless. 
And in the map, it's probably a little bit hard to see, but there's uh, some red pinpoints throughout the, uh, throughout the city. And those pinpoints are uh, designated as um, uh, like a thrift store, like the Goodwill and uh, Salvation Army. And we do see that there's a, a large trend of the homeless population that are going to the uh, Goodwill centers because what happens is there are people that are conducting uh, illegal dumping or dumping outside of the business hours and homeless will go find uh, items to take and they kind of take it throughout the city. Um, also, you'll see on this map, um, the hot spots are typically the areas that provide the most amount of resources, uh, freeways, off ramps, where they can uh, ask for money, as well as um, food and some of the services that they can get through like Social Security Office and what have you on Glendora. So some of the partnerships that we, we have uh, developed to try to help combat some of the homeless related issues that we have in the city. One of them is the uh, LA Housing Services Authority, which is LASA for an abbreviation. And Officer Ling partners up with LASA every Tuesday and they help provide resources to um, get housing as well as additional resources. For example, to be able to receive services within, uh, within a lot of programs, you have to have a valid California identification card or a valid driver's license. And a lot of times what happens is when um, a homeless person is traveling about, either their property is stolen or they lose their ID. So we've partnered up with DMV and can get them free vouchers so that they can get their identification so they can kind of get resources. It's kind of a lengthy process to try to get some resources, but we've been partnering up with um, LASA Union Station. And here on the line tonight is going to be a, uh, Raji. She's a, a Union Station uh, supervisor. She can kind of elaborate on some of the things that that uh, Union Station does. I'm sorry, she has not called in. Okay, I can touch base on uh, what what she's um, uh, responsible for. I'm hi, Officer Daniels. I'm I'm here actually. Oh, okay, perfect. So welcome, great. Yeah. So um, as as I get through the the PowerPoint, um, it'll it'll turn into some of her slides that she has added, and then after that will be Department of Mental Health, which should be on the line and um, then they can kind of follow up after. Anyway, so um, again, we'll, we'll touch base on the uh, Department of Mental Health in just a little bit. We also have uh, Terry Gresham who works with um, Officer Ling, and what she does is she um, reaches out to Caltrans, LA County Flood Control, as well as some of the local businesses and educating them and seeing what, what we can do to help prevent some of the homeless from congregating in some specific areas. City Yard is probably one of our biggest assets and partnerships that we have because we cannot do all the cleanups of the encampments without their services. They, they are such a tremendous help. I can't uh, say enough about them. So some of the other partnerships is uh, Caltrans um, because within the city, our residents don't understand that the off-ramps and the on-ramps are, they, they look at it in West Covina, so they think it's West Covina's um, territory to, to uh, take care of. However, that's not the case. Caltrans on-ramps and off-ramps, and uh, since our city is cut through with uh, the 10 freeway, they have to um, take care of those uh, areas of their responsibility. They are pretty responsive and I'll touch base on how and what their um, responsive times are for encampments. Same thing with uh, LA County Flood Control, I'll touch base with them as well, I, I follow up on with them as well. And um, so when a person that's homeless has to get into a housing facility or taken to a, a location for treatment, during the last year with COVID, they have to have COVID testing so at Lario Park, as well as the Cameron Park, um, we would have Officer Ling transport or have LASA or Union Station transport the individual to uh, COVID testing, and then that way they can get placed into a facility. Pacific Clinics is a, a very unique um, 
uh, service that's provided for individuals from the ages of 16 to 25. And in the past year that uh, Officer Ling uh, has been outreaching, he hasn't dealt with anybody under the age of 18, but between ages of 18 and 25, he can, they have a drop, a drop in centers is what they call it, where if somebody needs assistance between those ages, and it's whether it's just a shower, whether it's food, whether it's uh, hotel vouchers or what have you, that uh, Pacific Clinic will uh, be able to provide those services for those individuals. And there's no appointment needed. You can drop in. And he has taken some, of, some individuals to that location and um, have them receive some assistance. One of the things that we've done and I've done personally was outreach to some of the local businesses to kind of educate them on what they can do to help combat um, homeless from congregating in, in front of their businesses, around their businesses. Uh, I, I've personally talked to some of the managers at Food for Less, the Denny's, uh, the Goodwill. Um, as a matter of fact, we're currently working with the Goodwills trying to come up with a solution to uh, combat the illegal drop-offs or the, um, the property um, without being collected by the personnel. Uh, the one off of Azusa Avenue, we've talked to them about enclosing their trash receptacles because it's been very successful in other locations like the auto zone across the street on the northeast corner of Azusa and Puente, very successful in regards to uh, no illegal dumping because it's in a very secure facility. So we've kind of given them some pictures and talked to them about what they can do to help secure those uh, trash receptacles. So we've partnered up with them in, in regards to Wi-Fi because a lot of uh, individuals that don't have access to cell phones, they'll congregate in front of a location that has Wi-Fi. So we talked to like Denny's where they can come up with a uh, change of a password frequently and then they can just place it on the, on the table for their customers and that way it will help alleviate some of the uh, congregation outside their businesses. Same thing with um, electrical components, putting a locked um, plate over the receptacle to help prevent that. And then the, the last one here on, um, on the list here is Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center. Um, they have one in uh, Bassett as well as in Hacienda Heights and it allows us to uh, take an individual there for some mental health assistance. Okay, so as, as far as uh, placements in the last year, it's been um, it's it's been kind of helpful with COVID because um, we've gotten some state assistance uh, from uh, Governor Newsom with uh, Project Room Key. That's one of the state funded things that that he's kind of pushed down. And in the last uh, year, we've had uh, 39 individuals that have been placed um, in into uh, PRK Project Room Key or they've been placed on a waiting list. So as you see currently, um, we have three that are currently remaining in the project room key. We have six that are on a waiting list that have been already outreached that Officer Ling has been in contact with um, some of the individuals that can get them placed into project room key, which is Union Station and, and Lhasa. Six that have been transferred to project room key have been uh, moved on to more of a permanent housing. And one of the things that uh, they've come up with is PHK, Project Home Key, and that's the transition. If, if they're successful in Project Room Key, they get to move on to Project Home Key. So we actually have six individuals that have been transferred into that pro program. Five have been in transition from Project Room Key into a recovery center for uh, substance abuse problems. And um, five, I'm sorry, 11 of them have been accepted in the pro accepted to the program, but are no longer in the program for various reasons. Seven were referred, but they did not meet the criteria for Project Room Key. And one that was placed into Project Room Key was um, moved into a uh, domestic house, uh, violence shelter. And then approximately three weeks later, um, she had left the location. 
So there are some homeless individuals that uh, we encounter that do have a substance abuse problem. And what we try to do is really work with these individuals um, to get off of the streets and into a, like a recovery program. And Sam, on, on four different occasions, made the arrangements, had the conversations. You have to remember, a lot of time when we're dealing with homeless, there's, there's a lot of rapport building that goes on. And he's done a really, really good job on um, obviously identifying who's homeless in our city, providing the resources to them, and then kind of following up with them and trying to build that rapport to help get them off of the street and into some type of a, a program. And um, one of them is through American Recovery Center. He had four individuals lined up for the detox center. Three of those individuals um, did not show up. One did. She um, had Medi-Cal, but it was out of county. It was in San Bernardino County. So they had to um, basically refer her to San Bernardino County because they can't cross counties with uh, Medi-Cal. And then I'll, I'll briefly touch on um, our MET, which we do have a representative can kind of elaborate a little bit more. But every Wednesday, Officer Link partners up with LA County Mental Health, um, their MET team, mental evaluation team, and provides services not only to the residents but also to homeless. And, um, you know, th there's been five homeless individuals that have been referred that don't quite meet the criteria of what is called 50, 50, 5150 of the Welfare and Institution Code. There is a certain criteria that individuals have to meet um, to be placed on a 72-hour evaluation. And there's a lot of times we'll get calls for service where somebody's saying, hey, this person's not acting very rational. Can you guys go check on them? And we'll go out there. And sometimes they don't act completely rational, but they don't meet the criteria, so we cannot place them on a hold. However, with a, a clinician assigned to us that we get to work with on a weekly basis, we get to do follow-up and try to outreach to those individuals and see if we can get them some type of mental health services. And again, a lot of it's rapport building. Um, one was uh, 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 sent to LA County, and there was a conservative ship um, taken over with a family member, so we were able to provide services to one individual. Three of the three of them that are are currently in custody have been actually causing a lot of problems within our city. So with them being in custody, we've noticed that there's already been a, a decrease of some of the problems that they were creating. So sometimes we. We try to do our best to outreach to these individuals to get them the assistance they need, but we also take um, enforcement actions too. So if they're committing a crime, then we will address those crimes um, as they come up. And three of them are, ter uh, are currently in custody. One of them I heard was up to four years. So obviously it was a serious crime. And then one is currently at uh, Del Norte Park. This individual, I, I know um, in, in your area, Mr. Uh, or Council Member Tabatabai, that, um, that, that you were talking to one of our, our service area lieutenants in regards to him. And just so you understand, this individual was part of Project Room Key. He was removed from Project Room Key. And Officer Ling had uh, outreach to him and was working with his family members and trying to get him assistance. In the meantime, there were some uh, violations that were committed. We did take enforcement action, and he, had, he would have to appear in court before, for those, those issues, right? Um, but in the meantime, we, it's not just about enforcement action, it's about long-term solutions and trying to help solve the problem with him being on the streets. We reached out to a family member, and a family member was able to get him into some temporary housing, and um, it, it seems to be transitional. He'll go into a housing for a period of time, doesn't necessarily follow the rules or what goes along with the program, and then sometimes we'll see him back out. And again, the process starts all over again. And that, that brings me to another topic in regards to the parks, and it's the Martin versus Boise decision. And it's, it's hard for us to take some enforcement action and remove people out of the park um, because there's no there's no housing here for homeless. So under the, the Martin versus Boise decision, it kind of ties our hands a little bit as far as taking some uh, enforcement action with removing people out of the parks. Okay, so encampments. Um, this is a huge, a huge uh, issue nationwide, but obviously um, I'm gonna ad address some of the issues here in West Covina, and I'll spend some time on this because 
private property versus uh, city property versus LA County flood control versus Caltrans. Everybody's got a little bit different protocol that they have to follow. So I'll start with private property. So when we encounter um, an issue where there's an encampment on private property, we have to, we can't just go in there and remove the encampment because it's not, it's not our responsibility. We have to work with the business owners and that's where um, Terry Gresham works really well and then as well as uh, Officer Ling. Uh, works very closely with a lot of the business owners and, and business managers to, to try to have them expedite the process of removing encampments. We'll go there, we'll stand by, we'll provide security for them so it's a safe environment for the, um, the management team to remove the encampments and give notice to the individuals that they're not allowed to be there. We, we do put a uh, trespassing notice on file for certain individuals if they're, if they're one of those habitual reoffenders that go to the location. So again, we follow up with the businesses to, to work with them in, in regards to educating them on what they can and can't do with encampments. As far as city property is concerned, we do have a protocol in place and there's not a, a one size fits all solution for it. Um, if there's a, a small encampment we'll do, or a small property that has been left behind by a homeless individual, um, we can mark that property. We can mark it for a few, j a few hours that would, if it's a small item or a couple items, we can mark it, photograph it, and um, leave a notice behind saying that if this person doesn't come get their property by, say, a three or four hour window, then what we'll do is we'll do a safekeeping. So we don't throw their property away. We will take their property, we'll place it into a secured uh, uh, locker um, at, at our station, and then that individual will be left a notice of how to recover their property so that, that way they can get their they can get their property back. Same similar process happens when we're dealing with large scale encampments. So when we have a large scale encampment, obviously you see a picture there, um, there's a lot of trash and debris. So if, if it's readily identifiable as trash, we can dispose of trash, right? But if there is personal property that does have value and they have a lot of property, it's not something that we can just say, hey, we're going to mark for a couple hours and remove their property. We have to understand that they're, um, that's basically their housing, that's their property, and they, we have to give them a reasonable amount of time for them to take the property and move location, right? So there are some things that we can do maybe in a little bit more of an expeditious manner if it creates a safety or poses safety risk to the community or to the individuals, but typically we will allow a large-scale encampment up to 72 hours to allow them to get their property. And again, we're still outsourcing or outreaching to these individuals to pri try to get them assistance in the meantime. So when, when their property is taken, it's kept for up to 90 days. So they have 90 days to recover their property. When we're dealing with LA County flood control, I, I, I've spent uh, conversations with them. Currently under COVID protocol, they are not coming out to remove any encampments at Correct. So they are not removing any encampments on LA County flood control area as of right now. But before now, you continue, um, <laughs> yeah, because that's I. So LA County public flood control is currently not removing anything, or not cleaning, not doing anything. They are. They are not. They'll re remove like graffiti and stuff, but they're not removing encampments due to COVID. So I did speak to an individual yesterday in regards to that. Um, because we are currently having an issue on um, West Covina Parkway in Glendora. There's a resident that has, um, has expressed some concern, so we've been working with LA County Flood Control. Anyway, so they, it sounds like they should be opening up, because I asked them, I said, well, when is this going to, when is it going to open up so we can start um, addressing some of the concerns that our citizens have? It sounds like it's going to be opening up soon because of the reduction of the COVID rates. Um, but I do plan on having follow-up to uh, the LA County Flood Control, try to talk to the supervisor and see if we can get more of a definitive answer. And then uh, obviously we can, we can provide you with an update on that. Please do. I mean, yes. the word soon could be six months from now. So I, I'd like, uh, sure. well, the residents would like to know exactly when. So yes, please. We I want to add on, okay, um, my office in Temple City, okay, and behind they have a wash, okay, and. Uh, and, and uh, uh, Temple City Sheriff and County, they have about 15 Cayman. And I think a couple of weeks ago, they have been removed and they tried to place them someplace else. Was that, was that LA County flood control? Correct. 
Okay. So maybe you have to check with why, okay, and they can do it and why we cannot do it. Sure. Yeah, because, okay, you can talk to the Temple City City Manager. He told me, and okay, because in my office, okay, sometimes we have homeless people, okay, and doing a lot of defecation, this and that, and it just happened. Is it possible because and they do the some kind of, uh, okay, clean up on the wash, okay, and maybe those 15 people starting, okay, go to older places. They didn't help them to find a uh, housing Basically, they be become in the residential or in the business area and starting sleeping in the parking lot and this and that. So, so, so I think this is the wrong way to do it. You can help them off the street, not rather than sweep them around because they're still on the street. So anyway, maybe you can check with uh, Temple City, sure. okay, and the city manager, um, Brian Cox, okay, and uh, talk to him why we can do it and why we cannot do it. Sure. And in regards to uh, Caltrans, uh, they have a very similar protocol. Normally, when we make notification to them, they'll respond within seven, or they'll respond probably within a day or two, and then they mark it for 72 hours, and they're really responsive in coming back to address the the uh, encampments around Caltrans. And we've worked with them very closely and removed quite a bit of um, encampments, large-scale encampments. I kind of touched on it a little bit with uh, Officer Ling. So there, there's some, I think, I want to say maybe a misunderstanding of um, how arrests and citations are issued. When it comes to an infraction, so we'll get a call saying that there's a person that may be urinating in public, drinking in public, smoking in the park, or, or defecating, or what have you, and by the time the officer gets there, the person is not smoking or drinking or what have you, or they don't have the, the alcohol containers around them. We can't just issue a citation to an individual unless we witness it, okay, for an infraction. However, when it comes to a misdemeanor, so if somebody's committing a misdemeanor offense, then we have the ability to have the citizen. So if the offense is being committed when we're not there, then the citizen has the uh, ability to sign a citizen's arrest. We'll take the, uh, the arrest, and then we can process the arrest. And then obviously if there is a, a felony crime, then um, if we have enough probable cause, then we can make an arrest on a felony crime. So there has been some comments that I've heard that the officers will show up to a location, they won't do anything, and then they'll leave a location. And there, there are some things that, at least in the last year, that maybe the citizens just aren't aware of is our jails will not take they won't take certain um, offenses in, in, their, in their jails. So a lot of times officers will go out to a location, they will make an arrest, issue a citation, and then they would release them into the field. So it may look like the officer will respond out to the field, do nothing, and walk away. But those individuals still would have to appear in court based off of a citation that they received. So there's... <laughs> Again, there's some crimes that we're not able to hold people in custody for. Can you give me some examples of the misdemeanor arrest? So a misdemeanor arrest could be possession of methamphetamine, possession of cocaine, possession of a methamphetamine pipe, possession of um, uh, marijuana in large quantities. Um, there's, there's been some decriminalization with drug-related uh, things. It could be battery. It could be... Um, just trying to think off the top of my head, there's a lot of misdemeanor offenses that could be taking place that would have to either be witnessed by an officer or we would have to have a citizen's arrest for to take that person into custody. Okay, so in that case, if, if a resident does call, because we do get complaints that residents says, oh, they come, they didn't do anything, they didn't even. So if so, the resident that does complain, they have to be there and inform you now in regards to safety it is needed to be in front of them or how no, so they, they can do what we we do a witness uh, roll by is what we call it and typically we would have a, a witness in inside of our patrol car and their identity would be shielded uh, from the individual so we would roll by they would identify yes that's the person I saw hit the other person right we'll talk about a battery that person hit that other person. I want to place them under citizen's arrest. So they can stay within the confines of uh, the car at the time, but they would have to appear later in court as a witness to the crime. Thank you. I'm going to touch real, real briefly on uh, homeless funding grant. 
So uh, Kelly McDonald will probably have a lot more detailed information in regards to the funding, but we are part of a five cities uh, grant that um, we received. It was an 18 month grant that was supposed to expire actually last month. However, with uh, COVID and the funding uh, was not all used up, they granted the extension to the end of the year. And then obviously you can see it provides funding for a housing navigator, which is what we currently have. And um, Raji should, uh, will be able to kind of touch base on the, the navigator that's assigned to the city of West Covina. Um, motel vouchers, which we've worked with uh, Kelly McDonald in getting our voucher program up and running. And we do have a couple uh, uh, hotels or motels that uh, will take a homeless person in a hotel overnight. Um, and then obviously street, re uh, street outreach and enforcement. Oh, we have questions on this. Oh, go ahead, Councilman. Yeah. That's the only grant we have. And you know, we've been paying the quarter percent sales tax for the major age, and that thing for our city for previous four years, possible we pay $15 million for the major age. And that's the only number we have for the grant. Can we, do we have more grant we can apply? So they can, because I think we have quite a lot of homeless. Okay, and if we can grant, grant we can help them off the street. And I just wanted to share this um, so that everybody knows. Uh, Measure H, uh, which we all pay into, a voter special tax, in 2020, they received $355 million. With interest, it's $373 million, which LASA spends $215 million. So that grant, that is from our Measure H? That, that is my understanding. Okay, and so... Out of that million, I know we have to, that was, you said 343,000, but that's divided into five cities. Five cities, correct. So how much does West Covina get? I don't know the exact breakdown again. Very little. Yeah, I do, I, I remember that, but I just, I remember 300,000, but for some reason I thought it was West Covina, but it's divided into five cities. Five cities, correct. So, well, I guess divided by five then, um, and this is for 18 months, right? Correct. Okay, continue. Well, let's see somebody else. Yeah, I, so, so what, what, are, what are the re requirements in order to receive uh, Measure H funding? So when it was, it was passed by, by citizens, um, what, what did, what did the, the, the tax um, require for us to get access? I'll be honest with you, sir. I, I don't know. That would be a, a question that maybe uh, Kelly McDonald could probably answer for you. Did Kelly leave? He did. Oh, okay. Okay, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'd like to touch on some of the resources that uh, our residents would probably like to be aware of. So obviously the West Covina Police Department, our contact number is there. Our, our police department website is there, but underneath that is the, uh, the city app for services where they could report uh, a variety of topics. I mean, graffiti, uh, homeless, uh, abandoned vehicles, all, all those things. I put the, uh, the picture of the app so it's readily identifiable for our residents. And it's the Go request, whether you have an Android device or you have an Apple device, you can go to the App Store. If you go to the city's website and you type in, um, uh, I think it says ab about uh, city app or something like that, there's a link, a hyperlink. They just click on it from their phone and it's really easy to download, really easy to navigate through. And um, for the residents to understand that the, the supervisors that oversee the app get they can either have it to their phone they can also get it to their computer so when i receive those um those links i immediately can address it with uh, my staff to go out there and address those complaints so it's a really user-friendly app and um pretty pretty responsive as well can you um provide this to the residents of our city and also post it on the site uh, on our resource site um or on, I'm, I'm sorry oh i mean you could uh, both the city well the police and the <coughs> city website um, 
the resource phone numbers so that the sure. uh, that. one also promote it out if you can. Okay. Um, I can get in contact with our uh, press information officer and have him do that through our social media. And and are we, are we going to also get a copy of this PowerPoint yeah. sent, sent to the that was, gonna, that was my next question. Oh, great. Right, you've got Absolutely. me to. I would like that to be emailed. Sure. And then um, obviously Union Station, um, Homeless Services, their contacts on there, Department of Mental Health is on there, uh, LOSS is on there, as well as uh, LA County Flood Control and Caltrans. Also on Caltrans, it, on that link, it's very similar to West Covina's uh, uh, Go Request app. So if a resident does see something on Caltrans property, they can go on there and make the same notification to Caltrans. So it's, it's another website. Um, feature that they can report something to. Okay, so Raji, um, I'm going to kind of pass it off to you. I'm not sure if you're able to see it or not, but uh, um, your, your slides are up. If you need me to just push the next slide, just let me know. Hi, um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, good evening, um, everyone. Um, again, my um, thank you, Officer uh, Sergeant Daniels, for for having us, um, and um, to West Covina City Council for having us. Um, again, my name is Raji Shivshanker. I'm the Director of Outreach and Access for Union Station Homeless Services. Um, so I oversee our um, our staff who are. Uh, serving unhoused residents um, of West Covina. Um, so just um, an, a little overview of um, Union Station, our mission and our values. Um, so our mission is, is to prevent and end homelessness by, foc by focusing on permanent solutions. Um, we have services in housing, um, support services, employment, and community engagement. And those are just some of our, our values um, in the way that we work. Um, so we can, I, I can't see the slide, so if we could go to the next next slide, it'll be a map of the San Gabriel Valley region. Um, so the, the next slide is um, just an overview of our reach as an agency. Um, Union Station is the SPA 3 coordinated entry system, um, the CES lead agency, so we coordinate the um, entire San Gabriel Valley um, in a, a regional response to uh, homelessness. Um, this is done in partnership with other service providers, homeless service providers, um, city partners um, in different entities, including, um, for example, DMH and Tri-City Mental Health. Our core pillars of uh, services, um, so these are, are really what most of our programs um, focus on, uh, our outreach, um, so that in the five cities grant as well as the, um, the grant from the COG um, fall under outreach services, which I'll get into um, on the next slide. Uh, we provide um, shelter as well as bridge housing. Um, that has that has shifted in the um, in the you know with COVID. Um, and if anyone has questions about that, I can um, I can answer what that looks like now for our region um, in COVID times. We provide permanent supportive housing. Um, our our housing sites are in um, Pasadena, um, and then we also. Um, provide employment um, and community integration services. So we have several programs to assist um, our our um, clients with with building employment skills and um, increasing income. So the the I wanted to highlight the services that Union Station provides um, specifically in the city of West Covina. Um, so. In West Covina, um, your city has uh, access and entry points to the coordinated entry system um, for single adults, but also the family coordinated entry system. And the coordinated entry system is a countywide system, and it's um, organized regionally. So 
it streamlines the process of housing for individuals or families who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of, of becoming homeless. Um, we, within Union Station, um, we coordinate the region, and then we also um, house the SPA 3 um, matcher, so the, the, um, there's a person within our agency who sort of monitors the queue of um, housing and the availability of housing resources that come online. Um, West Covina also has access to a multidisciplinary outreach team. Um, so this team is funded by the Department of Health Services. Um, this team consists of a lead, so a manager, a substance abuse specialist, a mental health, um, a master's level mental health clinician, and a formerly homeless uh, peer advocate. Um, this team um, specifically partners with uh, USC Keck School of Medicine to provide street medicine services. So that is, this team um, covers West Covina as well as many cities around around West Covina, um, and they can be deployed uh, within 72 hours to uh, conduct street-based outreach and help uh, link folks who are in need of services um, to resources. Um, so you'll see the next program is the is, is the program that Sergeant Daniels mentioned um, that's funded by Measure H, and that's the Five Cities Street Outreach Program. So um, that includes the city of West Covina, Covina, Duarte, Glendora, and Azusa. So as a cohort of five cities, um, we have uh, one full-time housing navigator per city um, that conducts street-based outreach and housing navigation um, in the city. So for West Covina, the housing navigator, his name is uh, Christian Gonzalez. Um, and we also have a five cities program manager who provides oversight uh, to this program, um, as well as uh, training and support to our, all of our staff in the field. And as Sergeant Daniels mentioned, um, Christian is co-located at the West Covina, um, at West Covina City Hall. Um, so he's in the city of West Covina, either out in the field or based in, based in the office for accessibility. Also, um, part, of, part of our services in West Covina is the West Covina Motel Voucher Program. This is a program that we launched in October um, and provides motel voucher assistance to um, individuals who may need either anywhere from a 72-hour um, you, you know, crisis stay or overnight stay. Um, for emergency situations to temporary stays up, up to two weeks, um, and then in some cases even some longer-term bridge housing if, uh, we, if, our, um, if we encounter an individual who is connected or linked to a, to a permanent housing resource and we, ne we need to bridge that, you know, bridge that time so they aren't on the street. Um, and currently I think, I think we've had four, um, four individuals who have gone through the motel voucher program or are currently in the motel voucher program. And then lastly, um, this is our newest program, the um, COG Multi-City Shared Navigation Program. Uh, this is funded by the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, um, and it's a collaboration between six different cities, including West Covina. Um, and this, um, under this program, there are additional outreach and housing navigation services, um, as well as a rapid rehousing uh, component, which is rapid rehousing is a um, permanent housing um intervention that is um, that is funded under this under this grant. So West Covina has uh, four four potential rapid rehousing slots. This you know because the um, this is based on on funding um, that number could actually turn out to be to be more um, based on how the funds are used over time. Um, and we have one full time housing navigator. Um, named Beatriz, uh, and she is she serves the six cities under this program. Um, there are under this under this program there are also are um, a couple um, of motel voucher nights that can be utilized too. So this next slide is just um, a visual that shows the what services are um, sorry, my 
the slideshow went back. Um, the next slide is just a visual that shows what which services are provided um, in the city of um, West Covina. Um, you need me to go forward, or I think you can go forward to so slides. only three. There's only. Th three services that's provided, housing navigation, motel vouchers, and rapid rehousing, and all the others, basic needs, outreach, crisis, none of those, right? Employment, mental health. So, correct. Under these, um, under the five cities in the COG multi-city shared navigation grant, um, those are the services that are, that are outlined um, in the scope of work. The other, it doesn't mean that the other um, resources are not available in West Covina, um, and I should, sorry, I should have highlighted outreach um, as one of them. It doesn't mean that those services aren't available. Those are just not part of um, the contract for, so for example, an access center um, is not part of, part of the activities funded under one of um, Union Station, Union Station's contracts with West Covina. Um, and Motel, and I'll make a distinction, for example, between motel vouchers and crisis housing sites. So a crisis housing site would be um, a shelter. Can I, that's okay. Can I interrupt um, quickly? This is Councilman Tony Wu, okay? And I have a quick question, okay? Because I think the only thing will work my, as, me, as, as myself as a city council for the past five years, and I remember a previous police chief, okay, will give us a report when we have a joint venture, joint task, okay, basically with a, okay, a county sheriff and our city police officer, including the county of uh, mental health, okay, and the staff, and uh, okay, social service staff, okay, and a bunch of staff, okay, kind of a joint task, okay, and uh, went to the older encampment, okay, with about I think that times about hundred or something. Okay, and outreach, outreach work. We the report come out. I think okay, I think we have about twenty some homeless people. We help them off the street, and they have a report. Some of them we help them to back to their family. Some of them we help them to find the housing. But my understanding, last time I asked Supervisor Hilda Solis, okay, why for the past four years we only have uh, two outreach, like the task I'm talking about that work. Okay, and I think we should continue to do this kind of outreach and joint task, okay, with uh, mental health, okay, staff, okay, and uh, our service staff, and to, to and including county, okay, and um, okay, different agency, and joint task to help the people, because we have a mental issue person, we have a drug abuse person, we have a domestic violence, and we have uh, some people really, some people really need help. Not everybody wants to stay on the street. But 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 we need to help them off the street, not sh sweep them aw away. So this is only the solution. But I don't know why county only, for my understanding, you know, my memory only did it two times. Can we do it more often so we really can help those homeless people off the street? You're talking about the large scale operation that we did with the last uh, time. I think LA not County even that large. It's Lassa. just joining with a sheriff, joining with our city police and our staff. Combined with okay and okay county service okay and the personnel and uh, they they basically because we know where is in Cameron so we basically we went and the police chief former police chief uh, gave us all city council report regarding how many people have helped some people this and that some people arrest this and they have a warrant or something we have a detail okay and we I only received two times meaning okay my understanding only this very successful. Okay, and tests only performed two times. Councilman Wu, um, we, we do send a weekly uh, report that for every contact we have on a weekly basis, we give an update of what we do for our, our HOPE team and when they're partnered up with uh, um, LASA or Union Station or Department of Mental Health. So my question over here for you, the officer, okay, how often you join tasks with county with the one I just mentioned? Because last time I asked, the supervisor, because she said they don't have enough funding. So it's been a while since we uh, partnered up with LA County Sheriff's Department to do that large scale uh, operation. But my question is, we spend, we give them the uh, fifty million dollars. Uh, why we don't have funding to help the homeless off the street? 
in our community, and that, that's, that's working, okay? That really work because I see how many people they help to off the street, but we don't have that resource. County has a resource. That's, that's something I'll have to look into, sir. Some of the teams stopped. Like, we, we had an agreement with some of the chiefs that because of COVID, we're going to put down some of these teams. I'm sorry, and that's, that's part of the reason. I do agree with you that that process works. And, and as we get back to some normalcy, I think that is the way we should go. But right now, because of the COVID thing, it has been put down and we have not restarted it yet. I don't have a date for you as to when that might happen. But those, those situations only occur two, three, four times a year. And I understand what you're saying. We need to do it more often, but we'll have to work on that. Chief, okay, and before the prior to, okay, pandemic, they already stopped. When I was in the library with, uh, okay, the supervisor here does this meeting, I request, I said, it's, it work. Can we continue to help? And the answer is not enough funding. Well, it's not just that, but every time we do that, we have to take officers out of their assignment and, and, and do it. So some cities can't readily put those officers in there. Like sometimes we can't send someone there because of- I understand, but I'm talking about the, sh yeah. the county should bring the resource to us. Well, I understand. I'm, I'm, I understand. I'm not talking about, we, we have no resource. We have a very limited yeah. police officer. We have only have a, okay, a whole team for two plus one supervisor, right? So in very, in this big city, okay, 120,000 with a 70 square mile, okay, and uh, but sh supposedly, they have a more resource to help us to help the homeless. That, that's right. my point. And I, I, like you say, let let test it work. Can we help uh, with? Uh, can we request? Can we request county to help us? Uh, okay, and uh, work together to really help those homeless in our neighborhood, or oh, even sure. surrounding neighborhood because they are they cruise around. But it's really a human tragedy for all these people in the, that condition. Uh, and, and, and I, and I uh, agree. If we, um, that, that's not a team that's just sitting, waiting, that happens every week. Like some of the partnerships we have right now where we go out every week, that's a set time. It's a set date. We do that readily. That team you're speaking about is put together. It's almost like a task force where it has to be planned. It has to be put together. You're bringing in resources from a lot of different agencies, and that's how they put that together. But I agree that we can look at doing more of that. Would you please, yes, would you please request so we can have uh, a, this kind of resource that we don't have, okay? And uh, we can have a that we don't want too much. We just want maybe once a month, okay? And uh, okay, or maybe once two months, okay? At least we can look into all those in Cameron to provide help. I know if we don't provide help, we cannot remove them in the public, okay? Airway, uh, so hopefully we can provide help for them. And I agree. And right now, um, you know, it, it's it's not West Covina that gets to decide for, you know, Azusa County or whatever. We all have to come together and agree that we're ready to move forward with that. Some agencies are moving a little faster than others because of what we're in, but it is something that we'll start looking and, and talking about. And, we'll, and once we uh, uh, get something together, we'll, we'll bring your report. And let okay, you know. Thank you so much. I think it's so important to do the. Our homeless outreach and provide service. And I agree, and we're doing that. Okay. Um, right now, West Covina is doing Thank that. So we much. do a really good job at the resources we have. Can I know how many agencies are involved with that? It just depends. Um, the sheriff's is the biggest agency, and they have a lot of resources that we don't. Um, but a lot of times we're partnering with a lot of the surrounding agencies that touch us Azusa, Glendora, Pomona, um, you know, sheriffs, the county, La Puente. We, we, we try to do that because a lot of the transients in that area, they just go from city to city. Sometimes they come from further, but it just depends on who we can gather at that moment. So, so Chief Bell, would, would this uh, be something uh, to, to write a more formal grant to create some type of task force uh, that you, you kind of have in mind that we can do this kind of outreach um, more often as, as, a, as a formalized presentation in order to get the proper funding so that way we we can actually lead on that. Is, is that something that maybe we could look into doing? There, there may be something out there already like that. I'm not sure, but, but I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I can touch base on something that, that we were doing and what we were a part of. It was called a host team, and um, it, was, it was funded through Measure H funding prior to COVID. We partnered up with uh, Pomona and Azusa. They had the funding. 
but and they were in charge of um, outreach for multiple cities, including Glendora, Covina, West Covina, Pomona, Monrovia, El Monte. Um, there might be a couple that I'm missing, but what we would do is, in in regards to bringing outside resources in, they would bring in a couple officers from every agency would, that was participating, and then they would come in and then they would reach out to the entire city for hours out upon a time, and that was happening on a weekly basis. So that was happening prior to COVID. So that was a program that we were part of, I wanna say for well over a year, year and a half, where we were doing that outre outsource, uh, outreach um, with that host program. In addition, we did do the, the uh, I think there was a couple times that we partnered up with the LA County Sheriff's Department, and we did those that massive scale outreach. Uh, okay, uh, quickly because okay, I'm I'm not talking about a uh, full blown okay and a, a big okay an outreach. I think that's just too much. Okay, I think that that you do it only once a blue moon. It's just uh, like a show. But we, we need to consistently consistently outreach to those homeless okay population. Okay, because you you do it once a blue moon, once once a year, once a six months. It, it doesn't mean anything. But if we consistently okay okay do it small scale, but we need mental health service uh, okay to help us we don't have that right okay this is only county who have a mental health okay a personnel can help us to kind of find a way for them and the same thing okay union to okay uh, okay to a union station to help us to find a, a housing so we need to kind of find all those resources that we don't have Sir, we're, that, we're, yeah go we're ahead doing that right now that's, that's exactly that's, what officer ling does right. on a day that's his full-time job so he does outreach every single day and he partners up with uh, Department of Mental Health once a week. He partners up with. Do we have a, 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 a okay, homeless count? How many we have? And we we know we have a regular in diff, okay each of our park, okay and uh, okay or some of uh, Glendora have uh, quite a few, okay. So so because on the on the Chase Building they have a f quite a few over there, and uh, so I think we know who they are. I think you know who they are. They a lot of regular. So how can we help them off the street rather than, okay, stay in that place? You do have to understand that there are some homeless individuals that are service resistant. Yes, 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 understand, yes. Out there to offer services to them. They tell us, there's been times that I've gone out personally and I went to address some of these individuals and they will just walk away from me. They, we can't detain them. We can't, unless we have some legal authority to do anything, they have the freedom to walk away. They don't have to accept our services. True. So there are plenty of individuals that are what we call service resistant. They're, they just don't want our assistance. Got it. Okay, so so if we can consistent, like what you're doing, and sometimes we, okay, if we can get some county's resource, okay, and all united, okay, work together, I think we can, we can, and we should count it how many homeless, okay, rather than waiting for county to count it for us, I think we should count ourselves so we know how many okay West Covina okay have even including uh, the 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 underpass okay or freeway et cetera et cetera even it's county area we, let's let's count it to belong to West Covina see how many okay homeless population we have in West Covina so we count it 200 300 150 75 okay and we can easily to kind of uh, have a plan to see how we can uh, okay attack approach this issue so I don't I don't want this to be misconstrued um, what you're talking about sir we are doing right now um, the services that we're offering sometimes what happens when he's talking about these service resistant uh, transient type persons sometimes they'll say no 15 times and on the 16th time they'll say yes and that's that constant consistent every time we get an opportunity to see them every time we get a call we offer them service. Even even though we know they're going to say no or we anticipate they're going to say no, we continue to offer that service until they say yes. That has happened on numerous times. The problem is, is that process takes a long time, and it gives the appearance that West Covina is not doing enough or they're not, they're not doing what they need, need to do. Now, West Covina is one city, but when we ask those other agencies to come partner with us, we have to go partner with them as well because they have... They have homeless issues just like we do. Everyone's facing it. There's not one chief that's been spared from homeless. We talk about it all the time. 
So that's why we partner together to try to share those resources because some people have more officers than we do and they might be able to spare more officers to do this. And so we have to work together. But I want to assure you that that's what we're doing. And, you know, it's a slow process, but it's a consistent process. And we're going to continue to do it until something better comes along, right? More money would help. More officers would help, obviously. A bigger team would help. I understand that. Yeah. But right now, we're doing the absolute very best with the team we have. And we're going to continue to do that. Chief, I, I understand you try your best. I think that our team is doing their best. But we still have so many, many complaints from residents regarding homeless. They're talking about they're even scared to get out their house. Okay, and uh, so the issue still exists, okay, but how can we let the resident feel safe, okay, and uh, the business feel like they don't have been violated, okay, and uh, so I understand, and I understand, okay, we are trying consistently doing that, but we need to see some improvement to show our residents some of the homeless has been helped and has been helped, okay, off the street. I know on the uh, homeless, I mean, um, on the annual review, they did have a list of homeless section on there, and it did say out of 2020, they've uh, contact 862, or it was 800 uh, homeless, and then out of those numbers, these are the ones that, you know, a certain amount who actually accepted help, and then these are the ones who just, it was, it was a breakdown. So they did have the, uh, a breakdown of the, the homeless report on, with the city of West Covina. Make no mistake, this is an issue. We understand that. And it's an issue that we cannot take our foot off the pedal on. And we're going to keep our foot on the pedal and work with our partners as best we can and try and get through this. Uh, you know, I, if, I, if I could tell you what the solution is right this second, I'd be a hero right now. <laughs> um, but I just want you to know that we're going to continue. So we're president of the of United States. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, uh, no other questions. We can continue with the presentation, please. Or do you have something? Roger, else? are you still online? I'm still here. We'd love to hear the rest of your presentation. <laughs> Would you like me to move on to the next okay. slide? Okay. Yes, please. I think we're at we're at the last slide. Um, just give me one second. Okay. Well, I'm waiting for that. I just I just want to reiterate, and I can we can provide these slides um, to the council um, that the the outreach, you know. We've had the outreach services um, through Union Station and West Covina, um, as well as our other outreach teams um, that are connected. I know there was mention of the host team with it. That's with the sheriff's department. Um, but we also are able to deploy LASA um, homeless engagement teams, as well as the MDT teams. All of those are also outreach teams, um, in addition to DMH home teams. Um, and the street medicine team. So all of those are outreach teams that are available to West Covina in addition to the city specific um, housing navigators. Um, and the the newest program, the COG program, um, that is, you know, that really is building in the housing resource that was missing from um, sort of from the previous um, program. So I do want to re reiterate that this is actually um, for 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 us, um, this is this is real progress, and that you're that the city of West Covina has committed to and has made happen. Um, and if we, uh, uh, Sergeant Daniels, if we could go to the next slide. Oh, I think I, there there was one more slide, so I just wanted to um, give yes um, give. A little bit of data. Um, so, for the city of West Covina, from the 2020 um, That's a previous uh, homeless slide. count, um, the 2020 homeless count, um, there are 125 um, unsheltered individuals um, in the city of West Covina. Um, through the Five Cities Grant, um, our team of of five um, five staff have outreach to more than um, at this point more than 225 unique individuals throughout the five cities and um, 74 unique individuals in the city of West Covina. Do you guys have any questions for Raji? Council, does, do you have any questions? Well, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, you are, Union Station has an office here in City Hall, so residents, if they have questions or, you know, they can just 
swing by here. They're local. So thank you. Thank you, Raji. I appreciate you. Thank uh, you. And I will. Yeah, thank you. And I will um, share. Um, there is the Los Angeles Homeless Outreach Portal. Um, and I can share that with um, Sergeant Daniels to to share with all of you um, that can be shared with city with residents um, for anyone who should need services, um, who may be experiencing homelessness, that is the way to directly get to, you know, get to us um, so that we can deploy the appropriate team um, and make sure that your city's needs are, are being addressed. Is that portal separate than the LASA portal that residents can also put in or is, is it the same or is it different? It's the same portal, um, Union, but Union Station uh, coordinates outreach for the, San Ga the entire San Gabriel Valley region. So for, um, for the San Gabriel Valley, those um, outreach requests come directly to our outreach coordinator, whose name is Debbie Mota. Um, and then she is able to, based on the detail of the need, um, she's able to deploy an appropriate team. And then that way, um, you know, she has access to more than just one team. Um, so, for example, some of the teams that I mentioned that are not specifically from the Measure H grant or from the COG grant, um, they're from other sources of funding, um, we can also send to, to West Covina um, if, you know, if our other teams are not available or there's maybe a specific medical need or, or other need that uh, one of our specialized teams can address. Um, can that be included on that sheet that you have? I don't, I don't want to send multiple sheets to residents. If we could just comprise it all in one sheet, all the information. Go ahead, Roger, if you can just uh, send that to me, I can include that. Sure. I have a question for you. Okay, sure. uh, this is Councilman Tony Wu. Okay, and regarding the, you said the portal, we can request county, okay, uh, your department, or they have a portal for outreach. How soon, if somebody requests outreach, how soon you can send the team out? Okay, and uh, how often we can request that? Sure. Um, so you can you can request, um, you know, any anyone can make a request um, and uh, you can request um, you can request help um, or our services, um, you know, as many times as many times as you need. Um, are, are you sure? Usually our, our teams. Um, are you sure when we request? We, we will. We, sorry, go ahead. Um. So our, our, we aim for a turnaround time of, of 72 hours. So we ask that, that you give our teams um, 70 or three business days um, to attempt contact. Um, if we are, you know, sometimes we understand you may not have um, an exact, you know, a name or um, an individual may not stay in the same location and you may just have a cross street or an intersection. Our teams will go back multiple times um, to, to make contact and follow up on that request. Um, and I know I, I know you started to ask a question, so I just wanted to address that. Oh, somebody requests or city requests for this outreach from, okay, the portal for the county to help, three days, you, you, within three days, you will send a team to help out. Correct, and, and sometimes that may be, you know, as soon as the as we receive the outreach quest, uh, outreach request, um, and it's assigned to a team. Um, sometimes, you know, it could be it could be that same day, um, or it, you know, it could it could take um, seventy two hours. So we just give that range of time um, because our teams we do have access to teams seven days, seven days per week. Um, but our teams do work on on a pretty regular schedule. They're not um, they're not overnight they're not overnight teams, um, and so that it, it's you know we don't have the emergency response um, capacity in terms of um, you know similar to what a, a nine one one call would be, um, and we will follow up. You you can ask for follow up um, with our outreach coordinator to confirm that contact has been made um, and that we've, we've attended to that outreach request. Very good. So I will take your word forward. Okay, I w we will request your help and uh, hopefully within three days or same day, uh, we can get an outreach so we can help our homeless people around here. So officer, I think she says she can do it for us within three days. 
Yeah, okay. we, we are partnered with Union Station. They do have an office here in, in the city of West Covina, and we do work with them. Yeah, but my understanding, uh, people complaining is that nothing happened. So hopefully, with this meeting, uh, with this on the on the on the on the videotape, and okay, that we will get a service. Okay, we only need request service. That's it. Okay, to help out the people. Okay, not like we calling people. People never show up. So so if she says she can do this within three days, I I believe her. Okay, I take her forward. So we want to continue to utilize the service, have people to call, okay, and the call county, if, uh, okay, besides call our officer, and uh, we, since we have so many homeless, okay, and issue, we can have a county to help us based on the lady told us three days, okay, I or same day. there's a, a correction to and that. I just, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to clarify that, um, as Sergeant Daniels mentioned, so one of the, you know, one of the outreach, um, you have a full-time outreach staff in the city of in the city of West Covina, who may be one of the individuals responding to the outreach request. Um, I'm the the portal just enables access um, to to several more different types of teams, just so there's there's more outreach support. Um, and I just want to be clear that outreach um, we can deploy outreach teams. That does not um, that still means that that. Um, folks in, in West Covina who are experiencing homelessness may, um, it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to solve solve that problem um, overnight. It means we can start an engagement process and hopefully um, engage, you know, engage um, people in, in services. Um, and like Sergeant Daniels mentioned, that can be, um, that's a process that can take, you know, that can take months sometimes. Um and so I just want to be clear on what, you know, what outreach, what outreach will look like that our teams will, will be out, um, can come out there and will, and we do partner currently with the West Covina police department, um, about, you know, I think many of the individuals who they're already familiar with, um, but it is a, it is a process to link to services and to housing. And, you know, I've used that, uh, portal before, and I remember a resident used it before, and I know that you guys would come out and then, I mean, they're still there. Residents think that nothing is being done. But I'm glad to know that you can follow up now because I remember, I think this was two years ago, we couldn't follow up. And so, so you're saying today if they do put it in the system, they can call back and get an update, correct? Of what, if, if they were... Um Yes, more likely, um, and I believe it's an email feature um, to check in um, just to confirm that they're, they, or they they will receive a ticket um, in their email that says, you know, that has confirmed that, that, that their outreach request has been received and that um, it has been followed up with. And then um, I will, you know, Sergeant Daniels has my, has my contact information. I can share that. Um, and if there are any other issues or concerns or something, you know, something with the, the outreach portal. I know sometimes it's been, um, that system has been down. Um, if residents are reporting anything like that, you can always contact me um, and let me know. So if you have a resident, because not, not, this is not posted where everybody can see. So you'll have different residents looking at the same thing, not knowing if somebody else reported it. So if you have like 10 different residents who called in or put in, do they give, do they share information that that uh, person has been reached contact like a basic history so that residents don't think that this is the first time or is there some update um so our our coordinator can can confirm that um contact has been made and something if, if there are multiple requests for for the same person or perhaps um you know a resident may not may not know someone is is already in services with Union Station. Um, we have a, um, the homeless, we use the homeless management information system. It's a database um, where we can, um, we can look up um, based on, you know, based on certain information, we can look individuals up um, and, and then we can confirm um, that that request has already been addressed. So there's a way, um, I guess, if the concern is around duplication um, or, inefficiencies in that way um it's, it's kind of built into the system um that our outreach coordinator can check check for that okay um i do find it ironic that the homeless um 
Homeless needs ident identification ID for health, yet when you vote, you don't need identification. So if the homeless doesn't have that, and I dealt with one who is extremely paranoid to give out information, are they not going to receive help because they do not have ID? So we, um, for participation in Union Station um, services, we do not require ID. Um, that's a service we, we help provide. Many housing resources will require um, or, you know, ask for ID as, as part of an application process. Um, so our, our staff, our outreach workers actually help individuals um, apply, for, apply for an ID, um, apply for a Social Security card, um, and get a copy of their birth certificate. Those are just some of the common documents that are needed for housing. Um, we do not... Um, we do not turn anyone away um, for not having documents. We, I, I, you know, I think we expect that most um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness and who are unhoused um, probably don't have those documents on them. Um, so, yeah, so it, it just making that clear that there, there's no uh, pre, prerequisite um, for, for, being part of Union Station services or accepting services, um, our staff helps with, with all of those things. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have questions? Okay, so you can go ahead and continue. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Raji, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all, and have a good night. Charles, are you on the line there? Yes, I am. All right. And Charles is from... Can you Maryland? hear me? Charles is from uh, Department of Mental Health. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead Charles. Uh, everybody's ready. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, West Covina Police Department, for letting one of our clinicians uh, partner with you and doing work with the patrol officers, helping persons with mental illness in a crisis. And we're happy that they are able to help uh, Officer Ling once a week with the homeless outreach type of services and working with all the people we've heard about this evening to see if they can make a difference. Uh, other than that, I, I don't have anything else to report. I'm just here for questions. I'm a stand in for all the, the stars that are off tonight. So you oversee all the mental health issues in regards to. No, I, I'm. No, I work with the law enforcement uh, clinicians assigned to the 40 police departments in L.A. County. And we have one clinician that works with the West Covina Police Department. Uh, would you have information of how much uh, Measure H money goes to the Department of Public Health? No, that's uh, you probably have to follow up with Hilda Solis's office uh, and she can connect you with the uh, the housing Folks, that's not something that I'm part of. Okay, so uh, what exactly do you do as a, I know you said law enforcement, and, and is it within the five cities, the same, is this part of the no. um, Measure H or the, the little grant? No, I, well, no, this was an invitation we got from the police department that we we're going to talk about just our MET team. It's obviously become a, a bigger piece of in terms of the homeless. So I can't speak to any of that. Uh, the, the, the homeless people that are involved in your city, uh, in terms of the Department of Mental Health, uh, nobody was available for this evening because they didn't know about it till this afternoon. So I apologize for that. Uh, but the home team, H-O-M-E, is run by the Department of Mental Health, and they collaborate with all the players that you've been hearing from tonight, especially Union Station. And they work to help expedite any homeless person who's willing to have services to get to the shelter or mental health or medical or whatever it is. Uh, but there's a lot of people that say, no, thank you. No, thank you. Get out of my face. I don't want any of your help. And that's, that's the biggest challenge that everybody faces. No, I, I completely understand that. I work at a park in LA and uh, I've still see people that are there for years that I yeah. know one for 15 yeah. years that is still there Rambo. So I, <laughs> yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, so on your term, you said they just work with city of, I mean, I, I don't quite understand his role. So, 
uh, basically, Department of Mental Health has assigned a clinician to um, multiple cities to partner up and provide mental health services. And that's what his agency does is they provide a clinician to the city of West Covina once a week and they go out there and they try to provide um, outreach to people that have mental illness. So with those who have mental illness and refuse help or services, but obviously they're in a state that they can't help themselves, what happens to them? Uh, that's a big challenge today uh, from Sacramento on down, and that is the whole uh, 5150 criteria, gravely disabled due to a mental disorder. And uh, I don't have an easy answer for that one. If, if you have someone that everybody does believe is uh, their life is in danger because they're gra gravely disabled, it usually takes a, a group of people, a group of outreach workers uh, uh, up to come up with a plan of how this person will get help. Uh, okay. Did the council have any other questions? I just, for me, that I think that's the uh, most frustrating part is when I know residents see the ones who don't want help and we see that there's some type of mental illness that they have, um, but obviously you know, don't meet the 5150, the 5150 yeah, criteria. Now, in regards to, well, I guess now we're talking about law, where do we stand in regards to like indecent exposure, defecating? Um, and the reason why I speak, I, I know my husband took my daughter, they ate at In N Out here in Baldwin Park. And there was one gentleman who thought he had spiders on him and removed all his clothes in the middle of the restaurant. Um, obviously, my husband took my daughter out. But where do we go from here? Because here at our parks as well, um, and I speak in L.A., we have the most – L.A.'s homeless is just high. We have people who would go – oh, actually, we did have one here in West Covina at the bus stop because I did have a resident show me a photo – of this lady pulling her pants down and everybody can see her, you know, indecent exposure. I mean, what can be done with the indecent exposure and all the other things that is pretty much unsanitary? And you're more than welcome, well, either of you can answer. So for, for an indecent exposure, something like that is for uh, sexual gratification. If she has a mental illness and she's exposing herself, obviously we want to provide her mental resources. But if she doesn't want the help, so she would have to either meet the criteria or try. We'll try to outreach to a family member or talk to somebody that we can try to get her in contact with somebody to take control of her. What is there the criteria? I mean, this is the frustration part because I did. I mean, I, I did help a gentleman uh, at the bus stop a few years ago, and he still contacts me till today. Um, and I think everybody knows him. Uh, I do some follow up, but he was one of those that you know, nobody wanted to help, and um, he wasn't at that state to, I mean, he didn't want to give personal information, paranoid and so forth, but, um, you know, it, it took a while, and I did assist him, but, you know, what, what is the criteria for that? Because otherwise, uh, they're going to be rampage, rampaging through our parks naked uh, in the streets, I and mean, we actually do see that here in our own city as well, so where do you draw the line, or how does that work? So obviously for a 5150 criteria, they have to be a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or gravely disabled like he was talking about. And as far as um, every situation is a little bit unique, so I can't give you like a, an answer for it unless I was out there dealing with the individual and had a lot of the circumstances to be able to answer your question. Um, the officer should be able to go out there and determine what the best solution would be for that particular individual at that particular time. Uh, so, and the reason why is I, I talk to my LAPD officers, and I know that there's an increase of mental illness everywhere. Um, I mean, mind you, not just talking to themselves or, you know, cursing and just, you know, scaring the little kids that we have at the park. Um, and he did say that they're doing not just indecent exposure, but lewd acts, you know, sexual intercourse and, and so forth. Um, but I remember our LAPD officers said that you wouldn't be surprised that you'll have more naked people running through the parks and there's really not much we can do so that's what i'm hearing there's really not much that can be done every circumstance is a little bit different there are some times that we can go out there and we can justify 
if they're under the influence and maybe that's why they're acting irrational, that maybe that's why they're taking their clothes off. If they're under the influence of PCP, they get really hot and they take their clothes off. So again, every circumstance is a little bit different. So we would have to go out there and evaluate. Is this person suffering from a mental illness? Is this person suffering from uh, being under the influence of narcotics? Is this person being under the influence of uh, drugs and alcohol or just alcohol? Or there's just, there's a lot of circumstances. It's just hard for me to give you an answer unless I was out there interacting with the individual. I was just, yeah, I think residents would like to see. I mean, obviously I understand what you're saying, but the enforcement that, you know, we'd like to see that used to occur many years is no longer there. So I think that's the frustrating part. And I understand that a lot of it is our laws um, that just, you know, catch and release. And I, I, that's the frustration part on my end. Uh, did anybody else have a question? Was there more presentation for this? Um, did you have anything else, Charles? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate your time. A motion to receive no a fire? No problem, Sergeant. Well, actually, um, I don't know if, it, if... I just want to put this out for the, home, uh, the residents who haven't read the report. Um, there is the Homeless in California Audit State Aud um, Auditor of the State of California with, in regards to homeless in California. And, and, I mean, unfortunately, they only did five counties. I wanted to know, do any of you know why they didn't... Um, they didn't review LA County? Just, no. Okay, if residents do have a chance to read it, it is um, shocking. And a lot of, I find it is, this whole homeless situation is a state issue. Um, so for those who probably don't even know, and I know we go through the California. So in the whole United States, had the have unsheltered homeless population of 211,000 people. California alone takes on half of that at 108,000 people. And so California has the largest homeless population in the nation. LA County almost takes on half of California as almost estimated at 43,854. So obviously there is a problem with this and this is now a California state issue. I mean, California, it's a homeless pandemic in California. And then I know, um, or one of you mentioned that, you know, take it up to Sacramento. Uh, this would include our state legislators and, and is that, when, when they say take it to state, uh, to Sacramento, obviously I, I wanna take it to say, uh, Sacramento on this. Is that, does that go through our state legislators? Yes? Okay. No, um, I think it might have been me. This is Chuck, Chuck Lennon with DMH. No, I said it's an issue that that's a, a, everybody from Sacramento down to West Covina this evening. Everybody's talking about what to do because it's such a a, a challenging uh, issue. There's they can't nobody can figure out what to do. So everybody's talking about it. It's not bring it up there. They're already talking about it very much. No, I understand. I mean, obviously, based on the report, it's a California issue. I mean, if you. 50 states, California totally. takes on half totally. of it. Um, for those, I know a lot of residents are not going to read this. I mean, I did read it. It's a lot of information, a lot of detailed information. But I just want to put it out there so that residents understand the uh, key element. The state audit determined that the state continues to struggle to coordinate its efforts to address homeless, um, even having established a homeless coordinating and financing council. Uh, HUD awarded $441 million to 44. When they say COC, I know they mentioned it's continuum of care. Uh, we had that presentation earlier about West Covina. Um, to coordinate funding for service and housing to address homeless in California, 58 counties. The problem with this is that they're giving it to these counties, and different counties are just doing whatever they want. They haven't put everything together. Um, they said for at least 30 years, the state has struggled to coordinate its efforts to address homeless. Uh, state does not track the funding it provides to combat homeless. Uh, there, I mean, I wish we did a report just on this alone so that the residents could see. Is This is when they audited five counties. Um, it's all in here. Uh, there's just a lot of shocking information. And of course, I, I always say it starts from the top down. Um, I would like to not just 
you know, motion and receive, but I'd like to request that we involve the uh, state legislator, we involve um, other cities to be proactive in this and to write to the state, but that's probably going to be what council requests. Um, but this, you know, it's, if you read this, it's really good, and I'd like to thank the auditor of the state of California for providing this. It's a big mess. It's, it's just a lot of different things. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I, I have a suggestion, okay, for the gentleman say, Nobody know how to do it. I, I think maybe we can try give the resource to the city and let the city taking care of some of the issue. Okay, I think the problem is the city is powerless due to that we don't have a resource. So if if, if they can, if the Sacramento or okay and the county then nobody know how to do it. But please, okay, give some resource. Okay, for all those major age money. Okay, and uh, go to the all the different cities, have all the city okay, responsible, accountable, okay, to the, our local homeless issue to try to help those homeless, try to fel find shelter, try to find, okay, resource for them. Currently, our city don't have that resource, don't have that budget. We blink of uh, don't have any help from all this pandemic. So, so if, uh, if uh, Sacramento can think about uh, alternative way of seeing out of the box. Trust your local government and you can supervise how this money goes. Give us some resources. So this is my suggestion about how we do it, how we try to get Sacramento, the policy to do anything. I can guarantee nothing will happen. Everything the same. Give the local control. I do agree to a portion of this. Um, there's a saying, build it and they will come, but to what extent? I know borders are open. They all come to California. Um, I've been dealing with homeless in L.A. A lot of the homeless are not from here. So they're coming from Utah, Oregon. I mean, I've spoken to them, and I've asked one of them, like, why come to California? And, and you know what he said? Well, because they said everything here is free. Weather's great. It's free. So um, it, it's, they just have to address this at a, a bigger scale because if California takes on half of the population of the whole United States, there's an issue. Uh, I'm not sure if they can also, you know, provide like a whole Mayor, town or something. But. I think our our homeless people from downtown, not from Actually, Utah. and that is true. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't even be saying this, but I know with the Olympics coming out, you know, I heard they, uh, the uh, homeless actually get shuttled to the San Gabriel Valley. So whenever there's an Olympics happening, if you notice that there's no homeless population, they go somewhere. And guess what? Um, it's being shifted here. I know we've had a situation where we had a white shuttle that was dropping off homeless people in our city. And they're coming from outside cities. So they're not necessarily... The goal line. The goal line basically shipped them over here. So, yeah. So that, that's what I'm, I'm addressing. This is a bigger situation. It's not just moving it from city to city. And, you know, I know if we fix it here, who's to say more will come in our city? So that, that is my concern. I just wanted to bring it up to... A higher level. I wanted to bring it up to the state. Um, I feel like it's a state, it's a state issue. As it, well. I'd, I'd like to add for, for the residents interested, uh, a book, uh, City of Inmates. Uh, this has been an issue in California and Los Angeles since the 1880s. Uh, we were the city of tramps, so we we've had uh, the majority of uh, the U.S. homeless population uh, for about 150 years. So it it, it is a big issue. Um, but it's also a historic issue, and uh, I, I, I do think it's, uh, it's something that, you know, we've struggled <laughs> for 140, 150 years. Um, but, you know, Lieutenant Daniels, thank you. This presentation uh, and the work, uh, you and Officer Ling, uh, I, I can tell you guys have really approached it um, with the care, and um, thank you. I have moved a um, motion to receive and file. Do you want to, Mayor, you want to ask, ask something? You want to? Would any of you like to say anything? You. I was going to just say that it's time for a change. I mean, yes, it's been here for over 100 years, as Councilman Tabatabai says, but we need to change this. And there's more issues besides um, mental illness. I think there's a lot of drug abuse. And because I'm dealing with this personally with um, someone I know, um, it's a drug problem. We have a big drug problem out there, and we need to do something about that. That really is bothersome. And, you know, the 
state legislators, they need to know what's going on and they need to take action because it's jeopardizing our neighborhoods and I don't like it. Second, we got a first, we got a second. Roll call, please, and thank you again. Thank you. Awesome job, thank you. I have a motion by Council Member, uh, Councilman Wu to receive and file a second by Pro, Mayor Pro Tem Castellanos. Council Member Tabatabai? Aye. Councilman Wu? Aye. Councilwoman Diaz? Aye. Mayor Pro, Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Castellanos? Aye. Mayor Lopez Viado? Aye. Uh, motion passes. Now we're going to the Mayor Council Members Report. Any AB 1234 conference? No one? Uh, we're, now it's the City Council request. I do want to, well, obviously I made my council request in writing to the state, possibly having the other city join us to resolve this in a bigger level. Um, and then I want to make sure that we look into reducing and capping the delivery service fees, as uh, one of our public comment mentioned. So. Those are the two requests that I'd like to make sure that moves forward. Um, anybody else would like to make a council request? No? Okay, I see none. Um, this, I guess this concludes our meeting. Is there anybody who would like to adjourn? I'd like to adjourn. <laughs> okay. It's 11.08, guys. Let's adjourn. Okay, meeting adjourn. Have a good night. Thank you.